Welcome, everyone, to the fourth day of uh, MFS Wharton Summer School on Open Questions in Macrofinance. Uh, today, uh, I'm pleased to uh, welcome my co-organizer uh, in this uh, venture, uh, Itamar Drexler, who will talk to us about liquidity, risk premia, and monetary policy. As usual, please put in your questions in the chat box, and uh, Luke Min here from Wharton will uh, help Itamar uh, with uh, either relaying your, your questions to you, or in fact, um, uh, if you would like to speak up, uh, uh, Itamar will let you know, and Itamar and Luke will let you know when to unmute yourself so that you can ask your question live to make things more interactive. Again, um, thanks a lot to everyone and uh, for being here, and thanks to Itamar for uh, his lecture. We're looking forward to it. Thanks, Nick, and thank you to everybody for uh, attending. Uh, so I'm going to talk about like uh, the title says, the connections between liquidity, risk premia, and monetary policy. Uh, and uh, a lot of what I talk about will be related to the work that um, I've done over the last several years with uh, two of my co-authors, uh, Alexei Savov and Philip Schnabel. And uh, as we've worked on this, I think, um, actually the number of questions in some sense that we've had has, has kind of grown. So I'm hoping that as I share with you some of the results we have and the ways that we're thinking about it, that will give you also ideas uh, for kind of things you can work on. I think in particular, the last topic I'll talk about has at least for me in my mind, opened up a lot of questions that I look forward to working on. Uh, so let's get into it. So I, I wanna start with just some motivating questions for sort of food for thought that that will connect to what I do afterwards and give you something uh, for starters that you can think about. So the first one is how does monetary policy, which I'll abbreviate as MP, work and what does it do? So I thought going back that it's a pretty interesting thing that um, there's no very strong consensus uh, even among I think I'm an economist, maybe monetary policy people have some more consensus, but in general, there, nobody is completely sure how monetary policy actually works. So that we do have theories, but uh, given that it's one of the main things that economists are typically in charge of, at least the central bank, uh, and it's one of the most impactful things that that the uh, policy interventions that the, that the government and economists do, you would think that it would be clear cut how it works, and yet that isn't the case. So I always thought that that's kind of frightening and yet uh, makes it very interesting at the same time. And then uh, what does it do? So that even that there's, there's debate about exactly what does it change? So there's even an extreme point of view, which is not shared by that many people, but has, does have kind of a, a famous proponent in, in, in people like uh, Gene Fama, who believes that it doesn't really do anything, that it basically tracks what would happen uh, in the absence of any policy intervention anyway. And so I know, for example, he's very skeptical of this. That's not a mainstream view, but there are smart people uh, such as him and a Nobel Prize winner that just disbelieves that this thing is important at all. So that even that's an important question. Uh, and then if you think about it, what are the instruments of monetary policy? Well, we, t in conventional policy, we would think about the nominal interest rate, the short rate, the, the Fed funds rate, which I'll label FT, and in unconventional policy, which has become more and more important as the interest rate has gone to zero, there's the size and composition of the central bank's assets and liabilities. You can think about what these pieces are supposed to be doing or what they actually do. Uh, Related to it, so does monetary policy affect financial markets and prices? So not just, you know, traditional macro thinks about uh, and still does think about mostly things like consumption, uh, employment, investment, doesn't worry so much beyond thinking about the real interest rate about uh, financial markets or prices. And I'll talk a lot about this, but as, as financial economists, we think about this a lot. And um, so I, th I think that's something that, how, what kind of effects it has is a, question, is a big question that's still very much an open question. Uh, how important a role do central bank interventions play in the markets in general? So I think about monetary policy as a type of central bank intervention, but there are other ones. And in fact, over recent history, certainly since the uh, global financial crisis, but even before central bank interventions have clearly been very important. And I maintain that the central bank 
plays an important role in some sense just by existing all the time. So I think it's a good thing to keep in mind how, how, how big of a deal is it? You know, we tend to learn at first when we're students, um, you know, decentralized kind of arrow de bro uh, uh, markets where people can trade all kinds of securities and that's because it gives us a lot of insights uh, with a lot of tractability. But I think that in fact, government intervention plays a very important role all the time. And we're very far away from this very uh, decentralized uh, sort of purely market driven uh, situation in reality. Okay. And then related to this also, I want to ask the question, which I'll get back to in the last topic, how important a role does the financial crisis, uh, financial sector play in recessions? It clearly has played a very important role in the global financial crisis. This is kind of what put uh, made made people who deal with this face uh, the reality that there's no way to ignore the financial sector. I still think that in the majority of cases, people would think that outside of the financial crisis, probably it's not that important. But that's a question. I. I don't think that's the case. And I think that's a question that needs to be and should be uh, reassessed. Okay, so to put on the table a little bit, um, let's think about the workhorse models of macro and monetary policy as a kind of backdrop. So uh, the first one kind of the, the more most bare bones, which had a huge impact on macro is, is the real business cycle model, which I'm sure all of you have learned. And that's a, essentially a frictionless model where business cycles uh, that uh, increases and decreases in, in, in growth have to be attributed to shocks to technology, which are a modeling device, which not everybody knows exactly what they mean. We can think of situations like clearly COVID uh, crisis can be thought of as a technology shock, but in general, it was less clear. What is it? What are these shocks that are happening all the time? Um, and the economy in this set, in this case is in a frictionless equilibrium. So one of the big questions that always comes up is there's no involuntary unemployment in a real business cycle model, but clearly unemployment is a real problem. Not everybody who wants a job can have one. And so that's always been a criticism of the real business cycle model. And there's no important role for monetary policy. So the people who really are big fans of the real business cycle think monetary policy in general is uh, not a big deal. It maybe can cause some harm. Basically, the message uh, is don't play with the money supply too much because you might cause inflation. All right. I won't talk much about that because about the real business cycle model because um, I think it's a bit of a straw man. Uh, instead, let's think about uh, sort of the more workhorse model, which is the new Keynesian model. The new Keynesian model, as it's developed, is basically a real business cycle model with an additional important friction. And that is that uh, nominal goods prices or wages, depending on which one you want to focus on, are rigid. That means they don't adjust very quickly, maybe because, uh, uh, they, because of contracts or because firms uh, need to spend some effort or money to adjust them. And so what that means is that inflation kind of happens slowly. It doesn't happen instantaneously the way that it would if you added uh, money to a real business cycle model. And so then since it can't adjust very uh, rapidly, the economy can be shocked away from the frictionless equilibrium. So monetary policy there works by changing the nominal interest rate in such a way that the real rate, which is the difference between that and this uh, kind of sticky inflation rate, um, uh, you know, it needs to essentially change the FT so to align with the changes in the, the inflation that do not happen fast enough to keep the difference between them, the real rate, to be kind of the correct rate, the, the natural rate, because the inflation doesn't respond. And if you keep the real rate uh, kind of what it should be, uh, then, the, then in that case, monetary policy can bring the economy closer to the frictionless equilibrium that would happen in the real business cycle model. And by changing the real rate, you can you affect people's consumption and savings decisions, as would happen in any model. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is you don't know exactly what uh, the real rate should be, and that presents a situation where you have to do analysis and you might get it wrong, and monetary policy can bring the economy potentially away from uh, what would happen frictionlessly. But ideally, it would, it would be able to offset these, these uh, problems with inflation and keep the real rate at this natural rate. Okay. So that's, that is really the most, I think, that is one of the most important models in macro, uh, if not the most important one. So I'm going to talk about some pieces here that are missing, in my opinion, though I think a lot of people share 
least some of these opinions. So um, in NK models, uh, as we just discussed, really policy only affects the real risk fear rate. That's the main price or rate in the model. Uh, the classic kind of benchmark standard model is completely silent on risk premium. It really has no risk premium. It has no risky asset. And so you can't talk about it. Now, of course, people have expanded and tried to add uh, uh, a risky asset, but still in the main, um, in the main logic of the model that, that just not essential. And there's no direct impact of monetary policy on risk premium or risk taking. There could be indirect impacts through its effect on consumption or these kinds of things, but uh, just like any indirect effect, that's going to be hard to move the risk premium much. Not saying it's impossible, but there's no direct channel there. It's not something that's really at the heart of the model. Now, there is substantial evidence, which I'll discuss, that monetary policy works, both affects the risk premium and in part must be working through it in whatever it does. So to go back to a paper, I think it's a well-known paper and in my, but in my opinion, it's still underappreciated, uh, is a paper in the Journal of Finance of all places by, by Bernanke and Kuttner in 2005, um, where the, it's mostly, in the, it's almost essentially all an empirical analysis. And it's a, it's a, it's a nice paper to read. They, they write very well. I think Bernanke in general writes extremely well. So I highly recommend reading his papers. Uh, they show that rate cuts, uh, that's just Fed, Fed funds rate cuts, uh, increase stock prices are associated with jumps up in the, in the stock prices in the stock market, positive returns. And they decompose this change and conclude that it's due to a reduction in the risk premium, i.e. Uh, future average excess returns, not really due to decrease in the real rate. Now, according to the NK model, decreasing the interest rate cuts the real rate, and which it probably does, but that is not large enough by any sense to, inc to explain uh, the increase in the stock price based on their analysis. They do kind of a standard vector autoregression. Now, what I found really interesting reading this paper a long time ago is, uh, and you think of Ben Bernanke as kind of one of the preeminent macro and monetary policy uh, people in the world, is that the paper does not offer any mechanism for why this happens. Uh, and I found that shocking at first. So there's a bit of discussion that maybe by changing consumption, it somehow affects things through habit, but it's a, it's kind of a, by the way, discussion. There's no model presented. And it frankly seemed to me like they, they just wanted to put something down and they didn't really believe that that was the reason. It was just kind of a, a thought to throw out there. And I thought that if this thing is important, then an obvious question is, uh, A, is it true? And B, how does it work? And it wasn't just an academic question since there's been a lot of discussion for years ever since uh, Alan Greenspan was Fed chairman, but this idea of the Fed put, which was originally called the Greenspan put because it started with him, which is that the Fed seems to react uh, to market plunges, which can be associated with, with uh, bad macroeconomic outcomes by cutting interest rates, which causes stock prices to go back up. And so this idea that the Fed is catering to the stock market by lowering rates to increase stock prices. That sounds nice and, and natural, but the question is why does it increase stock prices? And the second question is why do they do it or is it a good idea? The first question is how does that even work? Because it's not clear necessarily that it should work under the NK model and certainly not the way that Bernanke and Kuttner found, which is through the risk premium. Okay. Um, how do I see, I don't see the chat. Where's the chat? I'm just curious uh, what the chat is. It should be in your main panel. That's probably at, at the black panel at the top. There is a window for the chat, but there is nothing, not, uh, no question. There's nothing yet. Okay, good, good. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I don't see anything. Yet. I think so, Luke, Luke can interrupt you when they're. When yeah, I, 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 I'm. It's just the beginning. I'm not uh, saying they're not asking for questions. But if anybody has question, I'll be uh, glad to, as we go through, to discuss them and and also talk to people, not just do uh, text chat. So, second uh, missing piece is um, then connected to this is a similar result, but now expanding the set of um, uh, the set of. Uh, the set of assets that, that this pertains to is, is, a, is a now a very well cited paper by Mark Gertler and Peter Karate uh, in 2015. And they look at not stocks, but they look mostly at corporate bonds, risky corporate bonds and mortgage backed securities, which are also have some risk to it. And they show that rate cuts narrow are associated with a narrowing of credit spreads uh, for corporate bonds and MBS. And uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but identification here of what's causing what 
and if whether it's due to monetary policy is a very difficult challenge for this literature. I think it's one that the monetary literature did not fully appreciate as actually Bernanke and Gertler in a much earlier paper sort of discussed. There's a lot of discussion of correlations and associations that became discussed as if they were causal, but because it's policy and it reacts to what's going on, there's a very uh, real concern that causality here is not causation, even more so, I think, than, than usual in economics, although I think causality is, is the main issue in economics uh, overall. So um, what they do, which is, was become, was Bernanke and Kuttner already did to some extent, but it became even more common since then, is to look at a high frequency data that is uh, in a short window, by half an hour, two hours, around uh, Fed uh, announcements, FOMC announcements, and look at the re reaction of asset prices. The assumption there is that they're reacting mostly to the, the rate cut the surprise portion of the rate cut, which is then interpreted as actual policy rather than a reaction to some economic news. It's still not perfect, but it's better and it overturned some earlier results. So I do want to show you because it's it's something I think everybody's learned about, but it, it until you see some examples, you may not appreciate it fully, is just to give you a set, kind of a ridiculous example for why causality, especially with respect to policy is difficult. This is a bit of a sidebar, but but I think a useful one for, for students in particular. And that is, let's, here I'm graphing uh, the Fed funds rate in red against a measure of the credit spread, the Moody's season BAA corporate bond yield relative to the yield on 10-year treasuries. Okay, many corp credit spreads look similar, they're bigger, smaller, but they kind of move in tandem. And I just graphed this on Fred. And what you see is the, the, the onset of the global financial crisis, the 2007 to 2009 crisis. So you see that coming into the middle of 2007, the Fed had rates that are over 5% and the credit spread was very low and almost historically low. And then as bad news is spilling out a little bit, uh, credit spread starts to go up and uh, the Fed starts cutting rates. And you see at the heart of the crisis, which is in uh, 2008, what do we see? We see that credit spreads are blowing out. So that's, if you've looked at this, not surprising, going to very high rates. And the Fed and the interest rates are going down. The Fed is cutting rates. So if you interpret this causally, you it would look like, wait, what's going on here? So the Fed is cutting rates, which is supposed to support the economy, and it's causing credit spreads to blow out. Okay, so that's now, I know what every, I, I said this is an extreme example because I think everybody can immediately recognize the problem here. But if in a less well-known, less extreme example in everyday kind of situations or other ones, this wouldn't be obvious to you. So here it just looks like, what, what the hell is the Fed doing? It's, it's doing the wrong thing. Things are getting worse, keeps cutting rates, and things keep getting worse. So what's the obvious issue? The obvious issue is that, uh, uh, you know, um, policy is not exogenous, it's not random. So it's responding to the worsening conditions. And in fact, the Fed must think that lowering rates help is helping and that conditions are occurring uh, uh, as kind of the thing, the starting point, the, the cause. And, and, and so that's why it's reacting to it. But if you just take a pure correlation between, uh, if you just think, well, I wonder whether decreasing the interest rate lowers credit spreads and you run a correlation in the data between them, this data point is going to dominate your estimate. And you're going to find that in fact, it's got completely the wrong sign to it. Not just no sign, but completely the wrong sign. Okay, so you need a form of identification here, right? You need something that's an exogenous shock to policy or, uh, isolate policy shocks. So one way is to do the narrow time window or high frequency, look at around a point in time where you think that the only news there is the policy shock. But again, it's hard to isolate. And another approach, which uh, my co-authors and I take quite heavily and is used in, in, in corporate finance and in micro, uh, but not so much in macro yet, although certainly other people are doing this, is to look at cross-sectional analysis if you have it. So sometimes it's hard because it's a macro thing. So there's only one of it, like the interest rate or so we think there's only one of it. Often there's uh, opportunities to look at a cross section and to look in the cross section for heterogeneity that allows you to isolate the thing that you really wanna look at. So I'll talk about that. So um, that was the sidebar. A third paper, again, along similar lines, and a paper I really like and highly recommend is Hansen and Stein in the JFE in 2015, a very simple paper, very clear. Again, these guys write very well. They show that 
rate cuts, again, using high frequency identification, um, decrease long-term real forward rates. So they're looking at say 10 year real forwards using tips, you know, uh, treasury inflation protected securities to take out the inflation component and look only at the forward real rates. And what do they, and again, they use high frequency identification around announcements to hopefully uh, identify actual shocks to policy. And, and what do they find? So they find again that long-term real forward rates, even 10 years out are being reduced uh, quite significantly when, when rates are cut. Now, this is a real puzzle from the point of view of the NK channel. And frankly, and there's been a bit of a back and forth about this. Uh, Nakamura and Steinson, who are big in the monetary policy literature, have published a uh, paper in the QJE arguing, sort of disputing this. But I don't think <clears throat> that the literature has um, at all reconciled this point. And my impression is, I hope I'm not being unfair, is that many people in this literature they may have heard about the point, but they just haven't really reacted to it. I talk to people about it, often not really sure what to do with it, but it is a serious challenge. And why is it a serious challenge? Because the New Keynesian model says you can only affect the real rates out to the point where prices are rigid. Beyond the point of rigidity, things should revert to what they would be in expectation uh, with no frictions. Now, 10 years is way beyond the kind of rigidity anybody realistically thinks uh, could be in the economy. There's no reason that wages or, or prices can't adjust for 10 years. So it's way beyond that point. So under the NK model, even the, the basic logic of it, not necessarily any particular parameterization, should not be able interest rate changes, policy changes, that is uh, something under the control of the central bank, should not be able to affect real rates out that far. Okay, so if you believe there are really policy shocks we're identifying, it's, it should not be able to affect the real rate out that far. Things would have uh, uh, converged back to the frictionless uh, situation by then or the steady state under the model. Okay, not, not frictionless necessarily, but the steady state. And so if that's not really affecting the real rate, the actual real rate people expect out there, it must be affecting the risk adjusted expected return of it. In other words, the risk premium on it. Okay, so that means that this is working the new Keynesian model through its effect on uh, uh, risk adjustment on risk adjusted expectations, which is what matters for prices. So um, the only way that real rates are affected and they seem to move around a lot in general in the term structure literature, much more than people really understand based on fundamentals must be that it's happening through risk prices. And they're showing here that, that this is happening. And why is this important beyond being a question for the NK model? Well, even in macro people talk a lot about the Fed affecting uh, the economy by changing long-term real rates. In fact, in order to change the cost of investment, uh, you have to change the present value of long-term uh, cash flows to change prices and to change the price of investing. If you want to think about mortgage, the effect through mortgages, mortgages are usually long-term. And there's a lot of papers in macro discussing, say, how changes in mortgage rates affect refinancing and so investment in real estate and growth and so forth. But under the NK model, it's not clear at all why the, the, the central bank should be able to affect these long-term uh, prices. And so we talk about it that way, but we don't have a good model for how this happens. So I think that's an obvious, open, important question that uh, I've been working on. I'll show you what, what we have, and, but I think it's an, definitely an open question. And um, so, uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the third point is it, what, the conclusion is that the rate cut lowers the risk premium of forward real rates. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and when you increase rates, it increases them. So that means that when you increase rates, you're increasing the term premium and that affects all long-term assets. Okay. Hey, Damar. Yeah. There's a couple of questions here in the chat. Do you want to take them now? It seems I, like- I am, there's something wrong with me. I cannot see the friggin' chat. Um, uh, well, let, why is we that? Hold on a second. I, oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, it just There's disconnected. A couple questions from Eve and a question from Son. Uh, so I don't know if you guys want to unmute yourself and uh, ask it live. Okay. Um, okay. Should um, Eve, uh, if you uh, let me read your question and then um, you can jump in. Should one assume that the NK model intuited the role of monetary policy through the interest rate, which works through the risk taking channel if one account for the financial sector. Okay, I'm not 100% sure what you mean. I um, don't think, you can always, if you mean, can you map it to that model? I mean, at some level you can always map everything to everything, but 
in terms of usefully and intuitively, I don't think so. I think it's just fundamentally a different channel. And I believe the channel of the NK model. I just don't believe that it does everything that people say it does. And I don't believe that it is the only thing that's going on. So, and then the follow up question from Eve is, well, should one assume that the account of the term structure of interest rates is an important ingredient for NK channel to affect long term real rate? I'm In general, I mean, that sounds like yes. And we'll, we'll, I'll get back to this uh, a lot towards the end and what the account, the narrative of the term structure. But I do think that there's a tendency, I mean, again, I, this is not, I didn't start out in this area. So maybe I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of what everybody believes, but I've talked to people who work in this pure macro people, not really finance. And I've asked them about this point, about the term premium and 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 the monetary. And first, a lot of people don't care about the term premium there, but the, a lot of people do. And, uh, and many times they just assume it. They assume the interest rate moves the term premium. That's what I've seen, at least, or some version of that. And that's not completely satisfying because you, why does it move it or does it move it? Maybe it doesn't move it. I think it does, but why? Um, from Sun, Sun Young, uh, with the Bernanke paper, is it possible that rate cuts are interacting with the risk premium via reaching for yield channel? Yes, so a lot of people have been thinking about the reaching for yield, whatever that means. And we wrote a paper that it was in JF, um, which I will just talk about, which that's how we started thinking about it. And it's not a behavioral explanation, so it maybe shouldn't be thought of as reaching for yield. But reaching for yield just means that if interest rates go down, risk premium go down. But yes, there's a lot of discussion about this for years. I think it's a very good question. Um, so uh, it's everybody has kind of their favorite theory. Showing things is very hard. And actually writing down a coherent theory is harder than it seems at first because uh, you run into sort of inconsistencies. Okay, a couple more uh, missing pieces in my view. So let's think about financial crises and interventions. And, you know, until COVID, this was something that everybody focused on the global financial crisis. But now we've had and a semi second crisis. This time the Fed was very aggressive in reacting. So, so far we've not had a financial crisis, but we definitely had the beginnings of one in a very aggressive intervention. And so that was the second time in about 11 years that we ran into that 11, 12 years. So that we have getting a lot of crises and Alan Taylor talked about this uh, yesterday. So crises are definitely very important and much more common than we'd like. Um, and the financial system, was, it became very clear in the global financial crisis had a very substantial real effect. And so it became impossible to ignore the financial sector in that sense. And then in the European sovereign debt crisis, I think it was also very clear that the uh, financial system and prices uh, were very important. And again, I think it's in March of 2020, if you were really paying attention, there was quite a lot of hysteria for several weeks that we could end up in a major financial crisis again. And the Fed intervened very aggressively, much quicker than last time. Uh, uh, based on what it's learned. And so far, at least, it seems to have been a good idea. Um, NK model is mostly silent about the causes of crises and uh, the interventions. Definitely people who believe the NK model have written papers about interventions, but I, it's, it's adaptations of new things. And sometimes I think it's adaptation of the same thing to try to explain this when it's, when it's a reach. Um, the crises they can have a knock-on effect that's strong through things like wage rigidities, like in Europe, wages didn't go down, but they are not due to price rigidities. That seems very clear to me. And so while they may have a knock-on effect and that matters, it's just not the source of it. And so the model can't speak to it that much or what monetary policy should do. And again, there's no financial sector in a standard NK model and many macro people have tried to add them. Um, the main model change in here, maybe I'm being a bit cynical, but the main model change since the global financial crisis that I can see to, it, to this model is just to add bank equity. Um, so the idea there was, uh, and it's a good idea. I, I like it. Um, I just don't think this whole thing is kind of to create a financial accelerator on the bank side, a la Bernanke, Gertler, Gilchrist, where it's really the firm's equity that matters and monetary policy can affect how much firms can borrow through their equity. But now it became the bank's equity that was the, the thing. And so it, when you have low bank equity, uh, that can reduce the amount of credit that's available and, and raise borrowing rates uh, superficially more than they should be. I think it's a useful step, but it's to me strikes me as still mostly uh, an add-on. 
to the nominal rigidities that people want to crank on the nominal rigidities afterwards, understandably. It doesn't capture a lot of things. It captures some things. It's a good idea. It doesn't capture most of what I think ha actually happens in crises. It doesn't explain how the crises begin. There's another thing which sometimes the models, not, not, not always, but in some models uh, following Bernanke, Gertler, Kilchrist, or Bernanke, Gertler, the Fed can cut rates. And part of what it does to cut rates is it kind of uh, is a backdoor recapitalization of the banks. It increases bank equity. Sometimes people say it's because, um, because the banks do have a maturity mismatch and they benefit from that. I will show you that this channel is not operable. It doesn't work. And so I don't think that it's important. Um, and lastly, the focal point of interventions from my vantage point has been in large part to transfer risk to the government's balance sheet. That's been an important part. So that's all about risk and not about rigidity, nominal rigidities. You see things that the government does like expand explicit and implicit government guarantees for banks, money market funds in the global financial crisis, various uh, bad asset uh, funds. Central bank has even moved towards buying risky assets itself, as such as happened in the COVID crisis. It's acted in Europe as a lender of last resort, where it itself lends against risky assets. None of these things, again, are, are really at the heart of the rigidity. They really have not much to do with it. So I think these all sort of beg a lot of questions for what is, uh, what is really at the heart of this kind of uh, intervention and policy. Okay, so let me get into some results. I want to start with something related to financial markets, since I've sort of questioned a lot of, you know, what, what, does, what do these things have to do with policy? Does policy do anything? Here's something that really caught my eye when, we, when I first saw it. So this, I took this from, from our, our paper in the Journal of Finance, Model of Monetary Policy and Risk Premium. Here's a connection between the nominal interest rate, the level of it, and uh, a price this is not a mechanical connection by any means. It's very long term, and the eyeball test shows you that they're extremely strongly related. And that's between the a measure of of the interest rate. We'll take the Fed funds rate usually, but they all kind of are similar. And a measure of what people called uh, the liquidity premium here for T bills, which is the difference between the Fed funds rate and the rate on T-bills. And people call it the liquidity premium because think of the Fed funds rate as already essentially the safe rate, and T-bills is maybe they're a little bit safer, some very, very, uh, uh, you know, unlikely state, but they, their government sort of quality safety or liquidity, you can sell them and you can sell them at any point and, and get uh, full value or fair value for them. And so it's a measure of assets that are essentially government quality safety. And the difference between them, it's typically small, but it has varied a lot. And sometimes it's actually gotten pretty big, as you can see on the left, it's gotten to as high as two and a half percent between two things that have both zero maturity, essentially, or the T-bill has three month maturity, and neither of them has any risk. Nobody has ever defaulted on either one of them. So that's a humongous difference for those two assets. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, T-bills in the world, and there are a lot of money market instruments that trade near the Fed funds rate. So that gap can be very important for learning about the financial sector. What do we see here? We see then the Fed funds T-bill spread on the left, that's in red, against the level of the Fed funds rate going back to the mid 50s. And like I said, there's, there's a lot of spikiness and those spikes are actually really interesting, but the, the moving average in general follows the level of the Fed funds rate, it's proportional to it very closely. So when the Fed funds rate is high, then the liquidity premium seems to be high. So the price of liquidity and the public liquidity in the economy is high. There's almost an 80% correlation. And the thing I want to point out is it's with the level of the nominal rate. Now that might seem natural, but again, in the NK model, the level of the nominal rate doesn't really matter. What matters is shocks or deviations from what people expected. It's only about the surprise from what they expected. If they expected it, everything adjusts and it's neutral. But if they, it's a shock, it matters. But here it seems like the actual level matters for this price, not the shocks, not just the shocks. Um, and we see that the price of government liquidity or safety is increasing in the nominal rate. And the spikes are interesting as well. I'll talk about some of them later, but the more recent ones, we know what they are in 2008 in the financial crisis. You see this, you saw this in the LTCM crisis. And that is interpreted as a flight to government safety. When things are really bad and people don't trust the financial sector, uh, even the, the safety of something very, very safe, like a Fed funds interbank loan, uh, they run to the T-bill and you can get a spike up in the cost of that 
super duper duper safety. It's kind of like a non-linearity in the safety premium. Okay. Um, I'll get to the question in a little bit. Uh, okay. So, all right. So uh, here's another similar thing in case you want to see something similar. So another similar thing which measures kind of stress in the financial sector or kind of the, the, the benefit or the, the demand for treasuries over anything the financial sector can offer is the TED spread. It's kind of similar. So it measures the difference between unsecured bank funding for three months and government funding for the three month T bill. So it's kind of maturity matched. And uh, I only had this available uh, in more recent time, but you often hear people talk about it. You see here also a clear relationship between the level of the Fed funds rate and the TED spread with the exception of the giant spike in 2008, which is again, I think this, both the, level, the trend and the spikes are both individually very interesting. We learned a lot about potentially what the nominal rate is important for from the trend. And it's interesting to then understand what it means about the financial sector when we see the spike. Okay. All right, <clears throat> whoops, I went backwards. Oh no, I didn't. Um, okay. So I wanna ask questions that I'm gonna address some of them specifically about these graphs. Why does the cost of, the, of government liquidity or safety vary with the level of the nominal rate? That's, there's clearly a relationship there, but why? Uh, that's the first thing I thought when I saw that. Since the price of liquidity varies, it has to be the case that either the supply or demand or potentially both for liquidity slash safety must vary as well. Do we see any evidence of that? Can we look at the total amount of this stuff? Sometimes in finance, we don't look at quantities, but it's a very good idea to look at quantities. Some people do this a lot. Like I think a lot of Jeremy Stein's work connects prices and quantities of financial assets. So uh, can we look at the supply or maybe the demand and see something there and understand what it does? Because it's clearly varying. Uh, can we find, so the first thing you think of, can we find evidence of fluctuation in government liquidity supply? I think first of supply. So in crises, in the spikes, clearly the demand is going up. That's the flight to safety, which explains this, this, the spikes. But for this long-term trend, to me, I don't think the demand is likely to be the story here because, um, because I think it's, it's uh, over long periods, it must be something about how much uh, government liquidity is supplied. Uh, because I think that if it was demand, you would think that the demand for liquidity, well, the demand for liquidity here would have to go down with the interest rate, right? Because we see liquidity premium going down with the interest rate. And they would tell you that when interest rates are low, the demand for liquidity is going down. But if anything, if it's cheaper, you'd think the demand for it would be going up. So I think this, the, 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 the pattern of it suggests that it's something about supply. So we can look for evidence of changes in supply. How would this relationship arise? So again, the supply of government liquidity would have to decrease as the nominal rate goes up to give you this bigger liquidity premium with the nominal rate to drive its price up. So that's the relationship we're looking for. And then if this relationship is there and there's so much uh, government quality assets, T-bills, T-bonds, and all these money markets that are priced off of them, what are the implications of this relationship for asset prices? And then ultimately we wanna know for real quantities, for growth, for investment. Okay, now I'm just saying there's a lot of government liquidity and other private sector liquidity and its price is apparently moving with the, with the interest rate and that might be important and I'm gonna argue that it is. So um, Arvind Krishnamurthy and Annette Vissing Jorgensen had a, a well, very well-known paper. It was published in 2012 JPE, but I saw it as a student several years before. It was out for a while, which started to uh, get at this liquidity discussion. Now, I think the liquidity discussion was actually one that existed decades ago. To my mind, it was took a different form. People didn't call it liquidity so much, but it came up when people were talking about money supply. That hit a snag and people, especially macro, seemed to have moved on from that. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know if it started with Arvin and Annette, kind of a revival of this, but I give them a lot of credit for it. Uh, a discussion again of the importance of this thing and kind of taking a slow, somewhat more modern approach to it. And I think it's promising. So they showed, they took another measure of the liquidity premium, again, very similar, which is the difference between treasuries and the in AAA bonds, which are very, very safe. So it's very similar to what I showed you. And uh, they drew this plot, which is looking at the supply of government debt. And they measure that by debt to GDP and the spread between AAA and treasury. So it's a positive spread. And so the idea, the basic uh, supply argument is if you have a lot of government debt, 
for whatever reason, then it won't be as, ex you know, as expensive. The liquidity premium would have to shrink because you have a lot of it. It's not as scarce. And they argued that that's what you see in this figure. <clears throat> so their original figure was the bottom curve. They've since updated, I took this from, from their website, additional data points that occurred afterwards. So those admittedly don't fit that well, but uh, uh, they argue that it's indicative and that it's an interesting argument, indicative of uh, an increase in the demand for liquidity, a shift that occurred after the global financial crisis so that the new points are kind of uh, fitting on a, on, a, on a higher demand curve, okay? Anyway, it's a very interesting relationship. It shows you that there's a big difference in the spread uh, when, GDP, when debt to GDP is high versus low. Now, this doesn't have like perfect identification, obviously, it could be other things going on. I think it's a very interesting point. And they estimated a very large liquidity premium that was 73 basis points on average, again, between two very similar things. And I should note, people who modeled corporate bond prices always realized that it's easier to match prices in the model to AAA corporates as the benchmark rather than the treasuries because uh, that extra 73 basis points was humongous and didn't seem to correspond in the same way to risk. If anything, it had some, put a huge price of risk on a very small difference in safety. Okay, that's kind of the nonlinearity. So Tae Young, uh, who was my classmate, sort of, Older than me is asking, when you mean supply, can you distinguish supply in the primary market driven by the fiscal authority equal, i.e. new treasury debt issuance or changes due to actors in the secondary market, i.e. Uh, uh, primary dealers? So yeah, I will talk about that. I think we want to distinguish, is it, is it, is there a difference between treasury supply and something that a primary dealer would supply? So primary dealers can't make new treasuries. They can, banks can create other claims. Uh, and I really want to get into the differences between them, but I, I will definitely talk about this. Um, okay. The previous question was, do the real effects of MP change in a Hank model where general equilibrium income effects come into play? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure what, I mean, Hank models are in a, in a different group. And so I don't I have to say, be honest, I don't really understand the question, but uh, so let me defer that or we can come back to it. Um, all right. So, Here's a, a figure from Stefan Nagel's 2016 QJE, uh, where he, he, he looked at this liquidity premium, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that's the one I mentioned that had a similar graph to the one that we had in our JF. Um, looked at this liquidity premium um, and uh, showed that, it's, that many measures of the liquidity premium, even the on the run, off the run spread, he showed was related to the level of the, of the nominal interest rate. And, uh, and um, over a lo very long period of time he had. And then one of the things he does is look at uh, sort of a, a horse race between the Fed funds rate and uh, as, as a kind of a measure or as a determinant, if you will, of the liquidity premium and the supply of treasuries. Now, it's a little bit of an unfair race because uh, the Fed funds rate is itself a kind of a, a rate. It's not a quantity. And so you're running, you're, you're running a horse race between a, a price and a rate versus a, a price and the quantity. Um, and so, but that's still, it's a question of, you could ask which one explains better. Now, almost prices on prices always beats prices on quantities because they're just measured better, but it's, it's, it's still an interesting thing. So they graph here, I think it's, a, it's inverted for debt. So it's an inverted scale. So it's, it's got the right sign. And what you see is uh, debt to GDP, uh, uh, and the, the Fed funds rate. Remember, the Fed funds rate tracks the liquidity premium very closely. So there is a correlation between these things, but the Fed funds rate moves at a much higher frequency over time than debt to GDP. Another thing that he looked at is, is T-bills to GDP because Greenwood uh, and, and Stein looked at that. That thing moves at a higher frequency, but still doesn't really track the Fed funds rate that well. So I don't have the regression table, but you can look at it. In a horse race, the Fed funds rate definitely wins. This does not mean that debt to GDP isn't a supply determinant of it. It just means it can't capture all the variation that we see because they track it, Fed funds rate and liquidity premium track very closely. And this is only at low frequency. So it certainly may be important. I, I think it is at lower frequency, but does not explain the much higher frequency. And by higher frequency here, I mean years or quarters, not decades. Uh, relationship that we see. Okay, I still think the relationship is very interesting, but it tells you that that is not simply the government is not changing the supply of treasuries fast enough to explain 
that re the very strong relationship we see. I think it's it's not even close. So, um, so uh, that's partially an answer to Young's question, but I'll talk a lot more about that. What's the other then? If it's not government um, bonds that are moving the supply, then what is it? Uh, so I'll share the answer. It's actually, there's not that many other things it could be because the other very large source of public quality liquidity, meaning government safe assets, really there's only another one and that is bank deposits. So in particular, government insured bank deposits because they have the government guarantee, the FDIC guarantee. And those are retail accounts, the ones sold to retail people, not the ones sold to institutions. But that is the vast majority of deposits. There's kind of a misconception in some circles that deposits are some anachronism from the past, in particular retail deposits, and that we've sort of moved away from that and nothing could be further from the truth. They've always been important and they remain very important. In fact, I was interested in Alan Taylor's graph yesterday. He showed that deposits were almost the whole story of how banks funded themselves. And he showed that while they're still very big, there's a lot more um, wholesale funding, wholesale funding meaning between institutions. But as he also mentioned, uh, some of that is between financial institutions themselves, uh, interbank, and kind of nets out. So if you look at total amount of funding from households to the financial sector, I don't think the picture has changed very much at all. Okay, it's changed somewhat. There's repo and there's commercial paper, but deposits are still very big. And as I'll show you, they get bigger and smaller uh, with the interest rate. Okay, so I think they're still very much the main event. So US government debt, just to give you a comparison, held by the public as of July, 2020, and this is hot off the press, was $20 trillion, give or take, a trillion here, a trillion there. Of this, uh, 6.8 trillion was held by uh, foreign governments. So not in the hands of, of uh, domestic investors, so kind of not really there. And so 13.2 trillion was available to US holders as a kind of public safety and liquidity. What was the size of, of banks? Well, commercial bank assets were also 20 trillion at the same point. Deposits funded 77% of assets. So $15.45 trillion, it's a lot. And of this, about 90% were insured retail deposits. So $13.7 trillion. So it is about the same size, even with ex hugely expanded government debt, about the same size as uh, government liquidity available. Of these 10.1 trillion was savings deposits, which are kind of pretty liquid, not as, can't be, uh, you know, not considered to be as easy uh, to get in and out of all the time is checking deposits, but still very much, which were 3.2 trillion. They're particularly big now uh, compared to historically. And then 340 billion were small time deposits. Th those are certificates of deposits sold to retail people. So that's pretty small by comparison. Uh, and then institutional deposits like firms putting into uh, banks uh, were 1.7 trillion. Those are called large time deposits. And banks equity, which we talk a lot about, was 2 trillion. So you see that the vast majority is still uh, deposits. And of those, the overwhelming portion is retail deposits. So the question is, if that's the other source of real public safety liquidity, does that respond to nominal interest rates? And the answer will be an emphatic yes. So this brings us this brings me to our paper, uh, Deposits Channel of Monetary Policy, which was published in 2017 in the QJE and is going to be the basis for a lot of what I'm talking about. So the basic story is quite simple. I'll show you mostly graphs. Um, we're arguing that monetary policy has a powerful impact on the price and quantity of deposits supplied by the banking system. So the relationship is a higher nominal rate causes, induces banks to reduce deposit supply. So they'll act like somewhat like a monopolist and that they have power over the supply. And they do this by, like any monopolist, increasing the price of holding deposits. What's the price? Just very simply, it's the difference between uh, a measure of the competitive interest rate, like the Fed funds rate or commercial paper rate or any of these similar things, or what you would get at a money market fund and uh, the rate that the deposit pays you. That's the deposit spread. Think about that as the opportunity cost of holding deposit. And so just like any opportunity cost, it's a price. Okay, so why should this be? Okay, so, the, so I'll show you that it is the case. The question is why? So we argue and we show a lot of evidence to this effect. The banks have market power in supplying deposits. Okay, so they have a control over the price and supply. A higher nominal rate 
in effect, increases their market power, gives them more ability to exploit their market power. Why? Well, <clears throat> besides deposits, the main source of, uh, of uh, very liquid safe stuff for households that they can, they can move into uh, is currency, cash. And the nominal rate is exactly the price of currency, the opportunity cost of currency. I mean, that observation goes way back, uh, obviously. And so a higher nominal rate means that cash or currency is more expensive. It means that holding it as a substitute is much less attractive, more unattractive even than it was before. And so banks face less competition in liquidity provision. Okay, it's a little bit similar to, you know, if airlines, if you want to fly from where I am in Philadelphia, well, I wouldn't do it now, but to uh, Boston and uh, airlines have a bit of a, an oligopoly there. And uh, as an outside option, I could take the train. I don't love it, but I could do it if they push me too hard. If Amtrak raises the prices on train tickets, then it gives the, uh, the airlines more room to push me harder by charging me more for, for airline tickets because the outside opportunity is, le is, less, um, is less attractive. And currency is like the deposit of the central bank. That's why it's called the central bank. So when they increase its price by pushing up the nominal rate, they give less competition as an outside option to deposits. In the model, actually, people hold nearly no currency whatsoever. In the limit, you can make it cashless. But it is sitting out there as kind of a threat. Okay, so we show this channel at the aggregate level, at the county level, at the bank level, and we drill down to the branch level. Because identification here is, is really a paper besides the model of identification. So we really want to show that this is causal and, and, and show what effects it has and really prove to people that it's really there. So what we're going to end up doing is something where we drill down so much that we're going to look at how the interest rate affects deposit rates at different branches of the same bank. So you might not know this, but banks charge different rates across different branches. Not humongously different, but you can see that they are different. And we're going to look at what causes those rates to differ and how they differ based on the interest rate. And we're going to find that higher nominal rates lead to higher deposit prices, that is higher deposit spreads, and then less deposit quantity, less deposit growth, just like a monopolist in markets, that is in branches that exist in markets where the banks have more market power. And that's going to tell us that it's really market power that allows them, that the, that the interest rate is affecting and that allows them to affect the, the, the amount of deposits. So, Higher nominal rates lead to less deposits. Now, as I mentioned, deposits are by far banks' largest source of funding. And the important thing is they're also their most stable funding source because they're government insured. So people do not run on them, okay? Runs are really a big risk for the financial sector and for banks. But unlike movies you've seen, essentially, and you can ask economic historians, they never run on government guaranteed funds. They only run on stuff that's not government guaranteed, stuff that comes from institutions like, like wholesale funding. And so they're really super valuable. They're even more valuable than, than the spread you can charge on them would suggest because you can fund all kinds of stuff and you don't have to worry about a run. So they matter for holdings of risky and illiquid assets. Um, so what the paper gave is, it's, if, if some of you are working on stuff like this, is a foundation for this literature on the bank lending channel without using the idea of required reserves. So there's been a large literature going ways back which uh, on the bank lending channel of monetary policy, which says as a conceptual underpinning, they're usually more uh, empirical papers showing that it has an effect on bank lending, but assuming that the way that this worked is because monetary policy interest rate increases increase the cause of holding required reserves. That's in the AR paper of Bernanke Blinder as kind of the, the channel. But I think everybody knew or suspected that required reserves are simply very small and do not matter at all. And in many countries, they don't even exist anymore, but we still see bank lending channel. So it kind of left an empirical literature without a, finan uh, without a conceptual underpinning, but now we don't need this reserves channel because something similar happens based on market power. Okay? And as I mentioned, deposits are the main source of liquidity for households. And if you reduce the supply of safe and liquid how, uh, assets, and one big chunk of it, that can explain why with less supply of safe liquid assets, the liquidity premium would go up. I think it explains something that I'd always wondered about, which is you hear practitioners making the refrain that when the Fed increases rates, it's draining liquidity from the system, or if it's lowering rates, it's pumping liquidity into the system. And I never understood why they would be saying that. So like in what sense do they do any of that? 
And I don't think we have a standard answer. But you could see the liquidity premium when you increase interest rates is going up. And now I'll show you that the supply of liquidity goes down and vice versa. And so there really is more or less liquidity. It's not that the Fed is pumping it or draining it out, but it's doing something that's causing banks to do that on its behalf. So some, uh, some data here. Um, I, I should stop for a second in case there are, before I get into the data, in case there are any questions, if anybody wants to. Uh, okay, so uh, Dario, does anybody, if you want to, you can ask your questions so it's not just me talking, but if you're shy, we don't have to. I don't know if you can hear me, can you? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so thanks for the presentation, first of all. So my question was, what could be the effect of shadow banks like money market mutual funds in attracting part of the deposits when, for example, inter nominal interest rates go up? That's a great question. So um, they do. And uh, I had the graph. I did not put it in the presentation, um, but that they, they attract a, some part of the banking deposits. Money market funds are much smaller than banks, even after existing for 40 years, but that definitely happens. So, and it matters because government insured deposits are different than, than, than money market mutual fund holdings. And, uh, and so their stability is different and their cost is different. And so the composition of, of liquidity, the composition of the financial sector liabilities changes. And that's a very important part. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, that was kind of the point of uh, uh, Kai Rong Xiao's job market paper from a few years ago. He's, in, he's at Columbia, which kind of coming off of our result, uh, wrote a model and kind of get into the, uh, the, the details of looking at this transference or this, this, this uh, uh, move away from deposits into things like money market funds. But it's definitely the case. You can see it very clearly in the data. And I'll, I'll show you something similar to it. Thank you. Uh, sure. So um, here's a, a, a graph, a pretty long-term graph. We have again our, the Fed funds rate in the dashed red. What we have in blue is a kind of a composite. It shows the average rate that banks uh, pay on retail deposits, people sometimes in banking call it core deposits, that is checking savings and small time deposits. So taking out the institutional stuff, the large time deposits. And still this is like 90% of their deposits right now. And uh, it, all three kinds of deposits pay somewhat different rates and we'll look, we'll, we'll utilize that for analysis. But what you see is the average rate that they paid. And there's a very obvious thing going on here. I think it's very striking. First, the clear thing is that it's less than the Fed funds rate. So even though there's so much deposits and they're safe short term and the Fed funds rate is safe in short term, they don't pay the same rate. In fact, they pay sometimes extremely different rates, which is very, very strange. Like you probably have learned of the equity premium puzzle and everybody thinks that's big. At least there's a lot of risk there. Here, there's not even a risk. And sometimes they're the same. You see that when rates go down, but when rates go up, the spread can become very different. So the spread here varies from as much as basically zero to 500 basis points. And, and it actually happens all the time. Even in 2006, 2007, the spread was 350 basis points, 400 basis points, I don't know. So, um, so there becomes, as, as rates go up, as the, as the competitive rate goes up, the spread becomes very big. Um, so again, the two things are, uh, it's lower, but also it's much less sensitive. And the lower sensitivity means that the spread uh, goes up, the price of liquidity goes up when the nominal rate goes up and down when it goes down. So that is gonna give us, if you take this as a measure of the liquidity premium, it's gonna get us closer to understanding um, where this is uh, coming from. There's a question, how difficult is it for households to buy treasuries? Um, not very difficult. It used to be more difficult. It's not very difficult for households to buy uh, money market mutual funds either. And they've been around since the late seventies. In fact, they'll talk about why they existed. Uh, and nevertheless, we have humongous amounts of deposits. So it's a good micro question. Why do we have them? Uh, there are many answers that can be suggested. So um, uh, um, I'm just looking at the questions. So there's, you know, banks, banks would respond that they provide lots of services quote unquote, right? And uh, obviously people feel that they do. 
okay, that for depositors, they can come in and uh, do branch banking and get lots of things, you know, services together with it. You could argue, as some people do, that selling, that they're more liquid than selling treasuries. I don't really buy that. Uh, yeah, checking account is more liquid than a treasury, but I think the difference is pretty small. But uh, I think it's familiarity. I think it's accessibility from branch banking and connection to other financial services. But the bottom line is, do I hold a lot of deposits? No, no, I don't. And so I think financial sophistication is definitely in the cross section, one of the things that's related to it. And when we did our work, uh, part of what you can use as an instrument for market power would be financial sophistication. Fact is though, that they're very large. And I think if the situation changes as we go to digital to all you know d digital money or, on, or, or, or uh, electronic banking if it changes the banking sector this aspect of it it maybe it will have very big implications for the for for the financial sector for monetary policy and the economy but banks have been amazingly resilient at holding on to this and if anything their power has not gotten weaker you could argue that it's gotten stronger so um nina's asking why do banks why do they not raise the deposit rate enough when the fed funds are as high well I think the question is, why doesn't competition force them to? They, they don't want to raise the rate, but of course, everybody likes to charge high prices. Remember that the price is the spread. And of course, you could always ask, why don't companies charge a giant spread? And that's because competition uh, doesn't allow them to do that. And the question is, why doesn't it here? And I think part of that is, is financial sophistication, uh, paying attention. For any particular person, how much, it's a real hassle to get your money out of deposits. They are government insured. And uh, you know, FDIC insured, uh, it's very familiar. And how much does it really matter? And all other banks are kind of paying the same thing too. So you really don't see any problem with it. But uh, it boils down to market power as, uh, as we kind of proved and as I'll show you. Um, uh, so uh, there's a lot of questions all of a sudden. Let me uh, go ahead a little bit and I'll come back to it because um, but if you're asking, if you're asking me, like, why don't all households move into online accounts and just own, uh, you know, uh, bond ETFs, short-term bond ETFs, or money market accounts? It's a good question, and uh, you should own money market accounts. And um, I mean, money market, you could say at least, isn't government insured, so we always run into a potential problem there in a crisis. But treasury bonds, they are. And, uh, but they are, banks remain, and, and these things have been around since the seventies and yet here we are. Okay, so I'm not so worried about the micro foundations. So here's the same kind of chart, but now we're going to look at those uh, three types of um, accounts separately. So checking is now in green, savings is in red and time is in blue. And what you see is there's a significant heterogeneity. So they're all less sensitive than the Fed funds rate. Uh, the time deposit here rate is usually one year time deposits or, or six month time deposits. So it really should be compared to the one year rate, in which case it would stay below the, the line. But you know we didn't want to mix up the figure too much. So we put it against the Fed funds rate. But if you put the one year rate on, it would look more, you know, always below. Um, and if you look at the spreads now, what you see is kind of what you expect from their level of liquidity. So the most liquid ones, checking deposits, which you can take in and out as many times as you want and so offer the biggest, the most amount of liquidity, have in a sense the biggest liquidity premium. They've got the biggest spread to the Fed funds, right? This, the liquidity premium also goes up the most with the nominal interest rate. So following what we saw about the liquidity premium in general, sometimes it's very low when nominal rates are low, but when nominal rates go up, it, it becomes enormous. Okay. In the very old days, checking deposits, not, not that old even, but before this time period, weren't even allowed to pay anything because they didn't want banks to invest them anywhere. So they had to be fully liquid in currency. And so they paid nothing. So the spread was the whole thing. They were just a complete substitute for currency. Okay. And savings deposits, which are the major category, also have gigantic spread. So they really drive a lot of the spread. It, they pay more than the checking deposits. They're somewhat more sensitive. And finally, time deposits where you give up liquidity to some extent because you still have government safety, but you give up liquidity because you can't take your money out for say six months or a year. Those are uh, much more responsive to the rate, still not 100%. There's still sometimes a significant spread there, even when you look at the one year rate, but you're giving up liquidity and the liquidity premium is indeed much smaller and it, 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 it uh, changes less with the interest rate. So in the cross section, we definitely have a lot of indication here that this is about their liquidity premium. 
Okay, now here comes the, here comes the million dollar graph here. Um, so what if we look at the quantities now? So we know that the price goes up when the interest rate goes up. What happens, you know, a monopolist can't just raise the price and, and, and keep the quantity the same. You can't shove it down people's throats. It has, to, it has to trade off a higher price for somewhat less quantity. And presumably that's, there's some trade off there that's beneficial. Okay, better for the monopolist than, uh, than the competitive situation. And is that the case here? Is there a trade off? Yes, there is. So let's look at the biggest quantity of deposits, savings deposits. Remember that savings deposit spread goes up quite strongly when the interest rate goes up. It goes down when the interest rate goes down. So with a higher spread, some people will decide to pull their money out of deposits and goes elsewhere. So whether it's a lot of a, a large outflow or a little bit depends on your point of view. So we can see here, obviously, a very strong negative correlation. So what we have is chain, so savings deposit growth rates, okay? year on year changes and year on year changes in the Fed funds rate. So you can see when the Fed funds rate is going up, when it's going down, these are the changes and changes in, uh, in the year on year savings deposit growth. So um, they're inversely related very clearly, very large flows from the point of view of aggregate bank balance sheets. So large, it can be from negative 12% change in savings deposits to plus 24% in a year. So we're talking about the biggest source of bank deposits. So these are really big changes. Um, it, like I said, they're the biggest, by far the largest category of deposits. And so that you'd think should affect how much uh, credit banks want to provide to the financial sector. Um, is it gigantic though? Well, from the point of view of, of the consumers, you might actually think it's kind of small. If I told you that the price of something went from a few basis points when interest rates are low to three, 400 basis points per year when the nominal rate is high, you would think maybe everybody should get the hell out of there, but only, you know, 10, 20% of the deposits flow out. Uh, you know, usually the outflows are actually lower. They, they go from plus 20 growth to minus 10 growth. So, you know, you could think of zero is not really the middle point, but you'd think that everybody would leave, but not even close to that is the case. So they are acting like a monopolist. They're, they're crushing it on the price and they're only losing say 10, 15% of the deposits. And clearly it's worth it for them. And presumably they optimize that. Um, so again, it, whether it's a lot or a little depends on your point of view. I've noticed a lot of people who in macro, to the extent they think of a deposit, think that they don't change at all. And that's not the case at all because it, such a reduction in deposits can matter a lot for the amount of credit in the financial system, which is what we explore. Um, I, I noted a very similar figure for checking deposits, just like their spreads go up. Now, what about time deposits? So we saw that time deposits have much less liquidity premium and their liquidity premium is a lot less sensitive to the interest rate. It doesn't go up as much. So here we see, as you would expect then, with, with, that they become a cheaper substitute for people. They still have safety, but they're, they're less, you give up liquidity, but now that the price of liquidity is much higher when the interest rate goes up, then these have, are comparatively much cheaper and you think that people substitute then towards time deposits. It's natural, you're getting really hammered on your liquid deposits. And so you say, okay, I see this great rate on the time deposits, I'm gonna switch to that. Okay, I give up liquidity. So the bank now knows that I can't run on them at all. They, they, they have this thing locked in, I can't even pull it out. So they really like that, uh, but then they pay a higher rate for that. And that moves up and down very closely with the Fed funds rate. So that partially answers the question from before, uh, this is for small time deposit. Do we see an inflow into other types of, of things? This is one part of it, small time deposits. And in a sense, the price of liquidity has gone up. So the production of liquidity has gone down. People give up liquidity. Okay, and that matters. Okay, that's not neutral. Uh, what happens to overall core deposits? Well, the overall relationship remains strongly negative. So there is a substitution but uh, to, to large time and small time deposits, but overall core deposits move inversely. There's a strong effect on the flows. Uh, and since uh, Fed fund hikes are endogenous, remember in response to economic growth, you got to think about this, you got to keep that in mind. So what was nice up to now is we can look at different deposit accounts and see even in the same time, how they react differentially to interest rate changes. But when we look at it all together, we, we have to keep in mind that when does the Fed raise rates? They raise rates when growth is strong. All else equal, when growth is strong, you'd think that banks want to lend more. They have more lending opportunities. And so it's actually kind of surprising that overall deposits would go down. Even if this effect was there, it might be overwhelmed by the increased demand. So what we're really seeing here is a net of two effects. Stronger demand, 
but an, an opportunity to squeeze depositors harder and therefore restricting uh, supply. And what we're seeing is the net, and it so happens that it's negative, but even if it wasn't negative, you know, that if you believe this channel, that it wouldn't grow as strongly as it would otherwise. But to know how much this is, we have to, we'd have to isolate it. So we need some identification and we're gonna use the cross section for that. Okay, um, so uh, bottom line of this part, deposits are very large. The deposit spread, the price of deposit increases with the nominal rate. So we find that for every 100 basis points Fed fund increase, the deposit spread increases by about 61 basis points on average. So they only raise deposit rates by about 40 basis points. Deposit quantities shrink. So this shows you that rate hikes cause a shift uh, in the supply of deposits. Okay, in particular rate hikes decrease the supply of these government backed, government guaranteed safe liquid assets. And there is a substitution towards uh, less liquid versions of them and out towards non-government backed stuff. That is uh, money market funds, uh, you know, because there's just less of it, you know, in, in equilibrium markets got to clear, you got to, people have to buy something else. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to do the model real quick, very short version of it. And then we'll look at the more empirical results and take stuff for questions. So we have a model in the paper. It's mostly an empirical paper, but I do, I think the model is, 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 is neat. It's a micro model, kind of like an IO model. Um, and uh, just give you the basic flavor of it. I've already given you the intuition for why raising the interest rate uh, would cause the supply of uh, deposits to shrink and why banks don't have to pay the competitive rate. So in the so we tried to make the model as minimalistic as possible. It, it, it turns out to be a little bit more complicated. So it's got a bunch of moving pieces, but you need all of them. So there's three types of assets you need. Something that doesn't pay any special, doesn't have any special liquidity. We call them bonds, but they really are catch all for all other assets. Think about it as all other assets that pay a risk adjusted rate or you know, risk neutral rate. Uh, that's the Fed funds rate. So you could just think of like competitive bonds. Okay, that's kind of uh, one benchmark. Another one is cash or currency. This provides uh, full liquidity, the most liquidity, it pays no interest, okay? So it's opportunity cost is the full interest rate F. And then you have deposits. So there's kind of two margins of adjustment. This is why the model is a bit complicated. Uh, you need both. Um, uh, and uh, deposits, they provide some liquidity. They're not as liquid as currency, uh, but they also pay an endogenously determined uh, rate F minus the spread S, F minus S. So their opportunity cost is S. Okay. Um, and deposits are created by N monopolistically competitive banks. So we can think of this as like, think of the model as a model of a local area. And then we'll do comparative statics to compare different areas where there's more or less competition. And then we'll use that in the uh, empirical analysis. So what's the mechanism? Fed funds rate goes up, cash naturally becomes more expensive as a source of liquidity. So the price of its liquidity goes up relative to bonds. Okay, we need to figure out what happens to deposits. That's the output. Banks are facing less competition and liquidity provision from currency. So their effective market power goes up. And so they optimally increase the deposit spread S. And households substitute away from deposits and currency because both of them are more expensive and into bonds, which affects the bank's funding, which is, I'm not gonna show you that part, but it's in the model. What do you need for this? This is like an IO model. Uh, we, we have <clears throat> different margins of adjustment. So you have an elasticity between liquidity and wealth. So as usual, we assume these are complements. As you get richer, you want more liquidity. Uh, so that's got an elasticity of substitution less than one row. And then there's an elasticity between deposits and cash. We want those to be substitutes. So we have an elasticity of substitution greater than one. And finally, we have an elasticity of substitution across banks. So multiple banks provide you with the same, with you know, differentiated deposits in, in the usual monopolistic sense. You, you, you kind of like them, you know, some are closer to you, some are farther away, or I don't know, you like the brand of the bank or whatever. But so they're substitutes, but they're not perfect substitutes, which gives them some market power. And what we show is you can, if there are a bunch of solution, that there's, you, can, uh, you can find this kind of composite parameter I called it M for market power, which kind of turns the whole banking, the, all the end banks into a representative agent kind of bank. And this representative agent bank, it doesn't, it, it's a monopolist, but it's kind of a partial monopolist. It doesn't act like it's the only bank. It acts like it's 
partially, like a partial bank. So, so like there's more than one bank, but not competitive. Okay, so, and uh, you could see what the M is. So it depends on the, the number of actual banks and on the substituted, substitutability between banks. It captures the local banking sector's market power and deposit creation. It's, there's less market power if there's more banks and uh, there's less market power if you can switch across banks more freely, if you substitute, you know, they all look the same to you. Yeah, so um, now if the market power is low, sufficiently low, the deposit spread will collapse to zero. Okay, it's actually if it's less than row. But otherwise, which is the case we're interested in, the spread in an area will be given by this equation. And there's two things, that, there's more in the paper. There's two things I want you to see. One, it turns out it's proportional to the Fed funds rate. Everything is kind of homothetic, so that's not hugely surprising, but it is increasing in the Fed funds rate, which is what we wanted the model to get, to explain. So as the Fed funds rate goes up, the spread charged by, by, by banks in the area will go up. And it increases more with the Fed funds rate where market power is higher which is the cross-sectional prediction that we wanna use for the empirical analysis. We're gonna look at different physical areas and we're gonna look for, for things that we think uh, instrument for market power. And we're gonna look at whether spreads react differently to changes in the Fed funds rate in those areas. And they do. Okay, and we're even gonna look within banks to, to hold other things constant. Okay, quick question here. So I had a couple of questions. Um, uh, okay. So um, when Bo is asking, it is still kind of hard for me to understand why people save less when deposit rate increases, even though not as much as the Fed rate. So I'm not saying that they save less. I'm saying that they save less in deposits. It could be saving more in other places. And that's because the cost of the liquidity of deposit, safety, whatever you think about it, familiarity has gone up. The point is they may go to other things, but that's not neutral. Banks matter. Government guarantees matter in particular, and this stuff is government guaranteed. Uh, Chen Yu Mao is asking, how should we interpret the negative deposit spread after 2008? Very good question. It's important. It spawned a bunch of papers. If you've seen Marcus Brunemeyer's reversal rate paper, people talked about that a lot. I, I'm not going to go into it right now. There's a long answer. It matters. Um, does it mean households, uh, Wenbo is asking, does it mean households have better outside options when the Fed funds rate is high? Um, they have worse outside options. Currency is more expensive. That makes deposits more expensive. You have worse, deposits are more expensive, might push you into other things. Doesn't mean they're, they've become better. It means what you had became worse. Um, okay, uh, uh, Amina asked, do banks lose market power when the Fed funds rate is very low? Yes, that's what the model shows. So the model is exactly showing their effective market. I call it effective market power because Market power is usually interpreted with this eta, and, and you know that's the how people usually interpret market power. But it's the effective market power is going down. That's why when the Fed funds rate is zero, they charge a zero spread, and that makes sense because the 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 outside option is is uh, perfectly costless. So things become a lot less costly. The liquidity premium goes down, and people hold a lot more deposits. That's what the mar the, the model is saying, and that's what I'll show you happens. Um, Nick is saying the flip side of this, how are online banks such as Goldman, Marcus able to pay rates upward of 1%? I think Nick, Goldman, Marcus, they have realized for because deposits are stable and important and because since the global financial crisis, regulation has codified some of the things that are we're talking about in the model, which were previously, I think things that were important, but some people chose, maybe some riskier banks chose to ignore. So now you're forced to fund yourself with more stable things. Otherwise you have penalties, like you have to hold liquid assets. So they, they realize they can't run in a, their business without having a retail bank. And so that this is promotional. They're, they're, they're putting, they've said that they've moved their business towards being funded with retail deposits. Okay. There are some online, some really random online banks that advertise rates on completely uh, you know, de demandable deposits of like two plus percentage points, which is, yeah, know. so you, there's always a risk that these guys are the guys that are about to go under, which has been shown. The Fed, the, the, the FDIC keeps tabs on them, so I don't know how long they can keep that up. I suppose they have a margin in which they can behave badly before the FDIC shows up. and Because and, it, it's been shown that when banks are about to fail, they, in a desperate bid to learn deposits, they jack up rates. And then people, some people don't mind because it's FDIC insured. You know, so you might get your money stuck, but you'll get it back. I think it's 
a little too risk loving for my taste, but uh, I don't know how long they can keep that up before the FDIC comes knocking. Or maybe they told them, look, we just want deposits. Remember that in a sense, I'm saying it's a, it's a good, better question sort of than it sounds even at first, because I'm saying that this, like, this stability, this government backing makes deposits even more valuable than their spread suggests. I'll show you evidence that's potentially a lot more valuable. So the spread is what you give up, but what they get is potentially more. They can fund all kinds of stuff that they wouldn't be able to fund otherwise while not having, uh, not worrying about, about crises and runs. And so it kind of under, the spread understates the value to them of, of uh, deposits. And that's why there's so many deposits. Okay, uh, it's the first time I've ever taken a question from Cristiano Ronaldo, so that's an honor. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the presentation that a simple way of introducing a relevant central bank and RBC model is to introduce sticky prices. My question is if there's any way in an RBC model of introducing unconventional policy. Um, people have introduced it. I mean, to, to NK or RBC models, uh, they've, they've assumed things that sound more like finance things, like the bank comes in and it buys assets and things. And so I think I'm not against RBC models. At the end, that's the, that's the, that's the foundation of sort of everything. Okay, it's just a, it's a rational model with, with capital. Okay, who can argue with that? That's great. The question is, what do you need to add into it? And, and I, I think that is the question. So it's nothing against RBC models. Ultimately, any model is going to be some kind of RBC model. It could be just that there's a lot of stuff going on besides technology shocks. And for the RBC people, that was the whole deal. They didn't like this nominal rigidity sticky price. Some of them didn't like it. So, but ultimately everything is going to have. So I think the answer is yes, people want to do these things. I think theory has often run ahead of evidence. They, they, they think about the global financial crisis, they stick in a bank that buys some assets and they kind of crank on their usual stuff. Okay, I'm, I, I'm, I sound kind of cynical here, but it's the way it looks sometimes. And sometimes that's been a, 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 a progress. But I think there's just a lot going on in the data that, that they're missing out on. It goes way beyond that. And that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, uh, Shu Shu Liang is asking, households seem very sophisticated to be this sensitive to spreads. I would say exactly the opposite. They're getting creamed. I mean, this, if you have a lot of your money in deposits, which it seems a lot of people do, otherwise you wouldn't get the 13 trillion. Uh, rich people have a lot of money in deposits even. You know, it might not be most of their money, but it adds up. And you are, um, and you are, uh, suddenly the, the, the opportunity cost went up to 300 basis points. And, and so you see that interest rates have gone up and you're like, you're kind of fine with it. It's not bothering you. I would say you're not very sophisticated at all. You know, you, it, it's not like these things happen at high frequency. They remain, rates remain high for quarters and years. And most people just remain there and take it. So I don't think they're sophisticated. I think they're the exact opposite of that. Or maybe they really like what they get from the bank, in which case all, all power to them, but it's still gonna come out to the same thing in the end in terms of effects. Uh, so I think this is a least sophisticated sort of assumption that you can have. Um, okay. And in fact, you find that there is more market power where people are older, less educated uh, and so forth. Um, okay, so get into the empirics now. So uh, more empirics. So I just, Maybe for this, the purposes of this talk, this was less interesting to you guys because this is about identification, but I don't want to leave it here and give the impression that that was the paper and then we just kind of like wrapped it up and, and we go home because there are many other things going on. It could be, we are, I already mentioned sort of the pitfalls of identification and if you're going to take it seriously, you want to know that deposit supply and monetary policy aren't just reacting to some, to different economic conditions. It's not an omitted variable. I will say if you think through it, the deposit supply shrinking, which I already showed you, doesn't really seem like it should be happening in good economic conditions, which is when the Fed raises rates. So there's not an obvious story for what would be the omitted variable, but nevertheless, maybe I just haven't thought hard enough. Uh, and in general, I wanna show you like, well, you know, I think a, a very fruitful approach for macro that we've taken in all our papers is then go to the cross section, taking kind of micro and especially in, in, in finance corporate methods to these problems. I think this is where macro is going is to use sophisticated cross-sectional cross -sectional, uh, uh, inference. So we're gonna exploit cross-sectional variation in local market competitiveness. Okay, now I think there are many sources of local differences. Like I said, I think age, uh, education are actually the most powerful ones. 
uh, the amount of marketing spent, but those are hard to measure and they're non-standard. So we're gonna use something that even regulators use and was used in the literature a lot. So we're gonna compute something very simple, which is the local Herfindahl index of uh, deposits at the level of a county. And you can do this, you can get this from, um, from uh, the FDIC uh, website, look at the amount of deposits, and we use a special data source, which a lot of people have access to now, on branch level deposit rates coming from RateWatch. Okay, so we're going to take the Herfindahl to measure of how concentrated dep deposits are in an area. There's a lot of banks and they each hold about equal weighted amount of deposits. So it looks like it's very competitive. Then the Herfindahl is going to be low, not concentrated. If there's a single bank holding all the deposits, the Herfindahl is going to be one. That's the highest one. The Herfindahl is literally the, the weighted average of the weights. So it's kind of some of the squared weights of the deposits. Okay, and regulators use this to assess uh, competitiveness, it's got a long history. So we didn't make this thing up. Okay, now I just wanna make point out, we're not saying that the number of banks or the Herfindahl is what determines all of market power. We, we, we had people telling us, come on, how could that be the whole thing? Nobody's saying that. Like I said, I think age, sophistication, advertising matter a lot more. We're just using it as an instrument. Okay, so it's for identification purposes to be clean and non-manipulable. Okay, so the main thing that I get to is we wanted to hold the main omitted variable you're concerned about is that economic conditions change banks' lending opportunities. And that really, that's what's causing them to take more or less deposits. As I said, I think it doesn't, it already kind of, if you think through it, doesn't get the sign right, but maybe it's happening in the cross section in a way that lines up. That the banks that have less lending opportunities, they don't want deposits. And so they change the price of deposits just to reflect lending opportunities and it has nothing to do with the Fed funds rate. It would still mean that they have market power. So they would, part of the story would hold up, but it wouldn't be about the Fed funds rate. And that's the key thing. It wouldn't be about monetary policy. So how do you hold constant a bank's lending opportunities while looking at differences in the effect of the Fed funds rate across branches? Well, you look at banks that have multiple branches in different areas. Now lending opportunities are at the level of the bank. A bank can take deposit raises in one place and shift them to another branch if it wants to lend them out. It doesn't have to raise them at that branch, okay? It's a bank, that's what banks do. Okay, so a multi-branch bank can lend at one branch and raise deposits at another. So that separates the decision of how much to squeeze the local depositors to charge spreads from how much to lend locally, right? You, you, can, you can squeeze depositors optimally, holding constant the total amount of deposits you raise and then shift the deposits to the counties where you wanna lend them. So it just decomposes them as long as the bank is smart enough to move money across one branch to another one, which is, a, there's actually been papers, Phil Strahan has a paper showing this, but I, I have to say, I took it at, I believe banks can transfer money. If they can't do that, they can't do much. So we're gonna compare deposits, for example, at a city branch in a low competition area with one in a high competition area and see whether in response to a Fed funds rate increase, they increase deposit prices, i.e. spreads more and see more outflows. And the identifying assumption, and again, is you can, they can move deposits from one branch to another. So long as they can do that, this holds. And the main result, I just kind of jumped to it. There's a lot of results. Is we run this cross-sectional panel regression where we look at the change in the spread of a bank in a county and we regress it on the county's Herfindahl index, the level of competition in that county, interacted with changes in the Fed funds rate. So that says if the Fed fund rate goes up, we should observe that in places that have a higher Herfindahl, less competition, there's a bigger response in the spread, a bigger increase in the price of deposits, that is they increase their rates less, than in one where the Herfindahl is lower. And we can put in fixed effects like in particular, the one I put in red, bank time fixed effect, so that we're only comparing branches of the same bank at the same time, even in the same state, we added state quarter fixed effect. So we have basically the most, the best specification here is the first one, the strictest, it has bank time fixed effect to compare branches in the same bank at the same time, state quarter fixed effect, branch fixed effect, county fixed effect, quarter fixed effect. It, it fixed effects the hell out of this thing. And you can see then taking away fixed effects that the, that, the, that the estimate is very stable. Actually, it, it gets bigger as you put in the fixed effects as identification gets bigger. And that's for banks that operate in at least two counties. If you use all banks, including ones that have only a single branch, so now less identification, you have to take away the bank time fixed effect, the, the, the effect does get a little bit bigger. So you can see that some of it is due maybe to, to uh, uh, demand differences, but not, not that much. It's pretty similar. So 100 basis point Fed funds rate increase increases the spread 
uh, in a low competition area by 14 basis points more than in a high competition area. It's a lot less than the full 60 basis points, but remember, we're just comparing using this Herfindahl. So that's not the world's like all encompassing measure of competition, but based even on that relatively noisy measures, not sophisticated, not optimized measure, it's picking up 14 basis points difference between uh, uh, low and high competition areas across branches even of the same bank. So that means it is the Fed funds rate causing it through the supply. It's not lending opportunities because those are held constant at the level of the bank and we're comparing within the same bank. What happens to the quantity of deposits? So now comparing the, the growth rate in deposits of those branches within the same bank. So again, with the, the bank quarter fixed effect, we see that there's a strongly negative coefficient, meaning for 100 basis points Fed fund rate increase, we see 66 basis points lower deposit growth in low competition, low uh, high Herfindahl versus low Herfindahl areas. Again, Herfindahl is just a very crude measure. So we saw 14 basis point bigger spread and 66 basis point lower growth for every 100 basis points Fed funds rate. And what we really wanna do is think of the elasticity as or the, the ratio of those two because both of them are just being picked up by this crude Herfindahl. But we see that both the price and the quantity are doing what we thought. Okay. Um, Another thing we do is to make sure it's really the Fed funds rate, we do a, an event study. We compare low and high competition areas in event time, basically run that, that regression in event time, even within the same bank, and see that the full change in the spread happens within a, basically two, three weeks, uh, basically two weeks of the Fed funds rate change. So it's not something about lending opportunities overall that's changing. It's literally when the Fed funds rate happens. And that's actually also an, uh, an evidence that the Fed funds rate is doing something. It's not, I think, as, as Fama would think, just kind of following things. Things only matter, only change right when the Fed decides to change the Fed funds rate. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, this evidence and then we'll take our break. So last part is, does this stuff aggregate up? Does it uh, affect lending? Again, there's, uh, there's, we see it shrinks deposits. Does it affect lending? There's an identification challenge is that lending is at the bank level. We can't do this within bank estimation. We have to compare across different banks and banks might have different overall lending opportunities. Even if they're more affected by the deposits channel, there's also this additional problem that they might overall be in areas with different lending opportunities. So what we do here is, and I, I think this is pretty neat, is look at banks that operate in the same county, but are otherwise on average exposed differently to market competition, to the deposits channel and all the other places where they raise deposit. So if you're a bank that tends to have a lot of market power where you operate, when you're very exposed to the deposit channel when the Fed funds rate increases, then you're going to charge higher spreads and lose a lot of deposit funding. And so you'll probably have to give up on a lot of lending relative to a bank that operates in a lot of other areas that are competitiveness, competitive, doesn't charge high spreads and doesn't then see much outflows and they'll be able to expand lending more. And we can look at them in the same county where they, they have same lending opportunities. So that's what we're gonna do, okay? And that we can do that with small business data, small business lending data. And so we look at that exact same thing, but now the, the Herfindahl is the bank's average Herfindahl in the areas where it operates. So it's the deposit weighted Herfindahl of all the counties where it operates. So you kind of wait by how much deposit it gets there. Not the Herfindahl of the local area. In fact, we'll control for the Herfindahl of the local county to make sure that's not driving anything. And now we can put county time fixed effects. So we look only within that, that county. And what you see, look at the first specification is a negative coefficient. So that means that banks that are on average more exposed to the deposits channel, so they operate in higher Herfindahl areas in other areas, they overall squeeze their depositors more, have less deposits and end up shrinking uh, lending more in the county that we're looking at relative to banks that overall in other areas are uh, operating in other areas where they're more competitive and therefore don't have this spreads quantity trade-off. And we can even include the local areas uh, branch, uh, 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 Herfindahl, to make sure it's not something to do with that. You can see when you actually put the local areas Herfindahl, doesn't do anything to lending, nothing. Once you, uh, eat, eat, remember it affected how much deposits you can raise there, but not how much lending is going on there. And that's consistent with the fact that banks can bring in lending from other places. Okay, so I think this is indication that it adds up and affects lending overall. Okay, not that we care that much about small business lending, but we have the data to show stuff. Okay.
Last thing is we're going to aggregate this up and we're going to look at the, the whole bank, uh, not just at small business lending and not just at Herfindahl, but we're going to be a little bit less careful now about identification. We're going to say, how can we measure the impact of the deposit channel on the bank overall? Okay, so we're going to try to get a measure of all sources of market power, consumer and attention brand, et cetera. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically look at how much, what the model says, look at how much the bank increases its deposit spreads when the Fed funds rate goes up. So we're going to estimate a bank level deposit spread beta. We're just going to run the change in the bank's average deposit spread on four lags of the Fed funds rate. Because, you know, it could take them time to increase the rates on on uh, the spreads on, on, uh, on the, some deposits, especially time deposits. And so we're going to look at basically if you get a shock to the Fed funds rate by four quarters later, how much is the bank's deposit spread, the price that it charges changed. And it shouldn't be able to charge that spread unless it's a monopolist. So it's a measure of their monopoly power. Higher beta means more deposit market power. Okay, so we can look across banks. I mean, the first question is, does this thing even differ across banks? And if it differs, does it tell you much about how they react to monetary changes? And the answer is yes for both. So if we, this is a bin scatter plot. So we take the thousands of banks that there are and in, 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 in bin them based on, you know, take the average within bins where the bins are on the x-axis, they're the spread beta. And the interesting thing is there's a huge vari variation in spread betas. Some banks have very low spread betas. They don't increase the spread much with the Fed funds rate. You can think of them as getting close to money market funds. Money market funds would have a zero spread beta. They have to just pay, they just pay the, something close to the Fed funds rate. And at the other end, point nine are banks that are really, really, really like banks. They only pay 10 basis points for every 100 basis point increase in the Fed funds rate. And so there's a huge variation there. And what we're graphing then is graphing these spread beta bins against the impact of 100 basis point Fed funds increase on deposit growth and asset growth. What you see is for more higher spread beta, more market power, more exposed to the deposit channel, there's a much stronger effect on deposit growth. Okay, it's much more negative. It's actually uh, minus, okay, I can't even tell. Um, and uh, I think there's a dot there, minus 30%. And uh, for assets, a very similar thing happens. So it shows you that it has an effect on assets. When you decrease deposits, you do a little bit of substitution towards non-deposit funding, but base, so assets is a bit less of an effect, but still mostly it's shown as a decrease in the size of the balance sheet, less, less lending, okay? An increase in the spread beta from the 10th to the 19th percentile is associated with 276 basis points, lower deposit growth and 194 basis points reduction in assets. All right, so uh, let me see if I, I will, skip this stuff and I will, I'll stop right here. Let's take a 20 minute break and I'll get to the final punchline of this and then we'll move on to the next thing. Any questions? Nina is reminding me to ask any questions on this um, before we take a, let's take a 15 minute break. Do you want to take a break now? Yes. If there are no questions, if there's a question, I'll make an answer questions. I think, uh, yeah, there is a question from Eve. Should, yeah. yeah, I'm going to leave this. The slide is kind of my the grand conclusion, so I'll leave it to the beginning of the 15 minutes. But uh, okay, uh, should one assume that deposit spread depends on the interest on credit as your model stresses the importance of the lending channel, which is important for the identification? What's the source of financing in the U.S.? Um, so I, I, I'm a, I'm a little bit not sure what you mean by the interest rate on credit. Um, I think, let me interpret it the other way around, which is I'm saying, and, and we've shown that by shrinking, you know, banks are like monopolists. They, they would like to lend to all profitable opportunities, but the problem is that to lend more, they need more deposits and to have more deposits, they need to charge less on deposits, but they don't want to charge less on deposits. Always. They want to squeeze the depositors because they have this government guaranteed safety, liquidity, and access and they can charge for it. So they trade those things off. And when the nominal rate goes up, they have more power to, uh, to, uh, to squeeze the depositors. And so they end up having a smaller balance sheet than they otherwise would. 
but that reduces lending to the economy and has real effects, the kind of effects you would associate with a contraction, uh, with a contraction in monetary policy that is slows down the, the growth and in investment, increases the cost of, of, in, of borrowing. And that's a completely different channel than price rigidity. And that's, that's what we're saying. Um, so it's, it, you were saying the paper is mostly small, small firms which are financing through banks. So that's not true. It's a very good question. So this was <clears throat> all assets of the bank, which are mostly not lending to small firms. I showed you the small business lending because you have the best data, because we can control and look at the effect within the same area. That's for identification again, just like Herfindahl. But the, but the effect is for the whole bank's whole balance sheet. Uh, and it, so you see asset growth of the whole balance sheet. In fact, this, the slide I skipped was, you see this growth for securities holdings, which is like mortgage-backed securities in particular, which is an, a strong negative effect. And you see it for loans, which are all loans, not just loans to small businesses. In fact, small, loans to small businesses are a very s small portion of, of this effect. Indeed, we have a follow-up paper, which looks at the impact of monetary policy on the housing boom of the early 2000s. And uh, I'm not gonna get into it, but it shows that banks did reduce lending a lot, but that private label securitization which was the new thing, took it over. And there's like a substitution across areas, places that had more reduction of banks, saw more private label securitization. So in that case, it's not small businesses at all. Um, if you're saying, uh, you're saying, I meant banks fixed deposit rates based on their intermediate activities. So one can assume that the credit spread matters. So you're saying, is there a feedback the other way? And there could be. It could be the case that when lending opportunities are, are better or credit is firms are better more credit worthy they decide to squeeze depositors less that was the loan demand issue that we talked about that could be happening it's not affecting our identification because we're looking within the bank but overall sure i think they trade off how much do you want to lend versus how much do you want to squeeze depositors and i think it goes both ways okay so let's take a 15 minute break and uh uh be back at uh, 156. Okay, so uh, welcome back. Uh, so if you recall where we where I started all this, um, the question was what explains the relationship between the interest rate, the Fed funds rate, uh, and the liquidity premium. So I was asking well, of the price moves, uh, and it seemed like it was a supply effect. Where's the supply change? It's got to be pretty big because there's a lot of this stuff. Um, so where is it? And um, so the answer is definitely in part. I think the major part is <clears throat> is through this channel that I've shown you. The the banks are reacting. They're doing the bidding of the central bank uh, to changes in the interest rate. I showed you that. Uh, if you recall this, the savings flow, the, the savings uh, deposits flows graph, that savings deposits strongly flowed in the opposite direction from changes in the interest rate. And, um, but we saw that overall, it's uh, the opportunity cost of currency was the level of the Fed funds rate. And so that influenced how much uh, uh, deposits banks take in or create and that influences the supply of this government quality, government insured liquidity. And um, so that should then with it change the liquidity premium. So the liquidity premium is on T-bills, but think about what happens when you, you reduce the, su the supply of deposits. Well, there's less of this public quality liquidity. Uh, depositors do leave. Some of them go back into funds that hold uh, T-bills. Uh, and so if, if the demand for public quality liquidity hasn't changed, then the price should go up. And so that's the general equilibrium effect. And we see that here. So I'm, we're just graphing the deposit spread, which is, as I mentioned, is a measure of the liquidity premium on deposits against the Fed funds T-bill spread. And they are very closely related to each other. And we could do the same thing with the growth rates. So the major source of fluctuation in the amount of government quality liquidity that moves with the Fed funds rate at the same high frequency and mirrors all the ups and downs is not in the supply of government treasuries, but in this, in this uh, deposits, uh, that's the main margin of adjustment. Now, I think if government changes the supply of treasuries by the same logic, it should also have an effect. It's really the total 
that matters, but the one that adjusts much faster is clearly the deposits one. So <clears throat> that brought us back to our original question. Now, I wanna take a very short, uh, I must, mostly wanna talk about empirical findings and things, uh, gives more, you more ideas, but it's nice to have a conceptual framework in mind for thinking about these things. And so I've kind of um, adapted one, the one that I have in my head right now, from a bunch of our work. One is this uh, model of monetary policy and risk premium paper that was in the JF. Another one, if, if you're interested, there's a very simple write-up we did for the annual review of financial economics that has a version of this. And uh, another one that we're working on. And uh, that's just a very simple, I'm not gonna have any equations, conceptual framework for linking liquidity, risk premium, and monetary policy that, that in itself, I, for me, helps to think about questions and uh, interpret, it's kind of a way to interpret a bunch of stuff you see in a coherent uh, parsimonious framework. So uh, first, what do we mean by liquidity? And it's kind of a hard term. So an asset is liquid if having to sell it quickly, i.e. liquidating it, has little, has little negative impact on, on the price you get for it. Okay, and now here's the, there's two key things of thinking about this here. So one is we think of the financial sector uh, apart from everything else. Uh, and th there's definitely precedence for this, for people thinking about it. So think of, I think of the financial sector liabilities as the main private sector source of liquid assets. Okay, they're not the only one. You have non-financial firms doing this, but financial sector liabilities are by far the biggest private sector source of liquid assets. And among those, as I showed you, the largest is bank deposits, which are government insured, but there are other ones that are not. So commercial paper, money market mutual fund shares, okay? On the other pillar, if you will, are government liabilities, which are called public liabilities. They're the other major source of liquidity. So treasuries, uh, now reserves are big, currency. There's another group that's kind of, in a, it's in a gray area, but definitely is a kind of um, a liability that provides liquidity, and it's a big area, are mortgage-backed securities that are government guaranteed. So agency mortgage-backed securities, Fannie, Freddie, the Federal Housing Administration. And actually, like a lot of things, those have become bigger and bigger slice of total mortgages. They're, they're quite gigantic, but since the financial crisis, the government back stuff has kind of taken over completely. Okay, and so that stuff is, is it, it's, it's also very safe because it's got a government guarantee. It used to be implicit during the financial crisis as tends to happen, it became explicit. Um, in the language of the very famous paper by Holmstrom and Tirol, uh, this is what they would call, the government liquidity would call outside liquidity. It's kind of outside the financial sector. And that's an important distinction. Okay, so now the key focal point for the starting is, is a financial crisis or a run. That's kind of the major problem. So when does a run occur? It occurs, this is a definition, basically, when households lose faith in the value of claims on the, that are purely on the financial sector. That's how I think about this, okay? So what that means is they, and it's easy to motivate this as a coordination problem, because if, if, I, if we all lose faith at the same time, nobody wants them, we all don't believe in them, then they really aren't worth very much and uh, for reasons that have become apparent. And so, you know, because it will, it will destroy the ability of the financial sector to hold stuff. And so it's self-fulfilling. So like any run, it's the idea of runs, there's this uh, equilibrium, which is the run equilibrium, which is a very dangerous one. And so when households lose faith, we get this, this run, um, which is self-fulfilling. And so in any case, whether it's for good reasons that there's a run, because the banks are bad or because, because it's, it's a, just a belief that we have, what happens in that case is we just lose faith in this main producer of, of, of uh, private sector liabilities. So we refuse to roll over, we refuse to buy their claims. We don't want them. So we're not gonna roll over existing liabilities and we're not gonna buy new ones, except maybe at a very steep discount. That's okay, I mean, steep discount is, is fine. What that means is that the financial sector now can't fund itself, has to sell assets, and that's gonna lead to fire sales, okay? It's, <clears throat> so the financial sector is the one that typically buys the assets. Uh, and if it can't buy them, it leads to fire sales. So it's, it's, that's the self-damaging, that's a self-reinforcing part of the equilibrium. Now, the second pillar, households don't usually lose faith in the value of government public liabilities. 
If they do, it's even worse. But let's say that happens less often. So why is that? It's easy to come up with stories. The government has taxation power, which private firms do not. Um, the exception are sovereign debt crises. And it kind of consistent because those are horrible. Because usually when the sovereign goes down, the financial sector goes down too. So it, it sits on top of it. It kind of highlights the aspect that public liabilities are so important. So you really, if both of them go down now, you really have a serious problem. Um, but in general, public aside from that, public liabilities remain liquid in a crisis. You can sell them. People believe in them and they want them. And that is the source of their liquidity premium over private liabilities that are otherwise, except for the state, of very similar safety. That's kind of the nonlinearity and the safety pricing is that they really are very safe, many private liabilities, but in a crisis, we don't want them. We only want the, 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 the outside liquidity, the, the, the public liquidity. And think about the Krishnamurthy Vissing Jorgensen uh, estimation of the size of the liquidity premium for government debt. Okay, so now I, the key mechanism, so to speak, for the monetary policy, which, which you've kind of seen now, is this kind of public, I call it the public-private partnership. Okay, so just like you have an, inv an investment project, uh, because the financial runs are catastrophic, okay, they're really bad, the government guarantees some of the financial sector's liabilities. This is how it came about in, in historically, okay? Um, and so we, I think of these as of these guaranteed liabilities as public-private because they're produced by the private sector, but they're guaranteed by the public sector. They have the same quality as the public stuff. And these tends to be mostly for claims sold to retail buyers. Uh, one reason might be that they're less sophisticated and so more at risk of running. It might also be political reasons. And then it makes these liabilities immune to run. So they become very valuable. And then they command the liquidity premium over private liabilities. Because this is all consistent with what we've seen. Now, retail bank deposits are the largest, most important private public liquidity. And it, historically, before the FDIC was created, panics, and this is why it was created, panics were frequent in the US and led to severe recession. So if you go back in history and a lot of good papers on that, these, these panics happened all the time. They constantly set off recessions every so often. And this is why the Fed indeed was created uh, to avert this. Um, and central banking has a very long and illustrious history going back to, to Thornton in the in, in beginning of the 1800s in, in England, and then Badgett, who was the founder of the Economist newspaper, who are both gave advice on central banking for the Central Bank of England precisely to deal with these panics. So these panics have a very important role in history. Now, the key thing is for this public-private partnership is even though the government stamps their guarantee on these liabilities, it's the financial sector that largely retains control of their supply. Now, there can be some restrictions. There's certain things you can't do, but it's still the margin of adjustment still lies with the financial sector. And that's what that's what gives you this, this kind of elasticity, this interesting mechanism. I think that's the insight. Okay, so the other part is banks then, so if banks, if, if, the, if the public part, private stuff was fully competitive, then there would be no margin of adjustment. They would just, uh, the banks would, you know, pay them the Fed funds rate and, you know, it would not capture, it with the, this uh, extra guarantee would not really, you know, have to be changing with the with the nominal rate, and it wouldn't matter. But if you have market power, now there's a, a room for this to matter. And it's natural that the market power should be on the stuff that's government guaranteed. You have no reason to run, and you have no reason to care what happens to the bank, so you stop paying attention to it, which is kind of the point of it. Okay, maybe they want you to pay a little attention, but not too much. So that goes hand in hand. So they have market power of the supply of deposits in the nominal rate that determines their ability to exploit it, as I showed you because it controls the, the cost of the outside opportunity. So what that means is when there's a higher nominal rate, they charge higher spread on deposits, they reduce the supply of deposits. Now let's think about it in the context of the two types of, or three types of liquidity. It reduces the quantity of public type, public quality liquidity. So there's fully private stuff, fully public stuff, public private stuff, which is really the same quality as the public stuff, but the private public is controlled by the private sector. And as you showed the nominal rate, adjusts, it kind of guides or governs the amount of it produced. Okay, so when it decreases it, it, raise, it reduces its quantity and it therefore raises its price. That's the liquidity premium. And households end up having less of this stuff to hold on to, right? Because they reduce supply. Okay, so what are the implications of this? This is kind of the way I'm thinking about it. 
uh, and what we've talked about. So <clears throat> let's think about leverage, risk taking and risk premium. So the second stylized way I wanna think about things, I wanna think of the financial sector and this is what we did on our JF paper as, uh, as, as uh, uh, risk sharing between more risk averse households, which I'll call depositors in general, and more risk tolerant investors, which just very generally, let's call them banks. But here it can mean all kinds of levered investment firms, banks, hedge funds, REITs, whatever you want. Okay, so all that stuff, we'll think of them as banks. That's like what we call them in the paper. So the people who are naturally, the agents that are less risk averse, who wanna take more risk, they naturally want to borrow from the ones who are more risk averse. That's what risk sharing is. I wanna take more risk than you do. Therefore, I'm gonna to have to borrow from you. You're gonna want me to give you safe claims so I produce a safe claim for you and I'm gonna take on more your, some of your share of the risk. That's the risk sharing. And I think of the financial sector as doing that or even the financial sector equity, if you will, is representing the risk tolerant people. Just like in the old days, um, before all the investment banks went public, there were partnerships. The partners owned the equity of the investment bank and the investment bank did risky things. Okay, so the risk averse people will naturally want safe assets. The risk takers want to borrow. This happens in any model, i.e. take leverage in order to earn the risk premium, which they perceive as more of a good deal than the risk averse people do. So they're naturally, there's trade. And think of those as the banks. Um, now the banks, they would like non-runnable funding. They're exactly afraid of this run, this financial crisis that has been happening forever. Uh, there's a question. It is completely okay to ask questions, but that wasn't the question. Uh, what happens if binding constraints break the connection between the risk free rate and the opportunity cost of intermediation? Um, so I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question, but there is very much a break between the risk free rate and the opportunity cost of intermediation. That's the market power already gives you that. So when you think, how much do I, if I wanna buy this asset, it could be risky, illiquid, I have some, I need some deposits and to get some deposits, I need to charge depositors less. And so I need to decrease the spread. And so in addition to paying them the risk fee rate, I also gotta give up some of the spread for everybody. Um, and it says the, the market power gives you a markup. By the way, I, I don't like to think of it as a markup. Markup in the IO literature has this sense that there's a cost of something and then you mark up over it. And that thing is not, it is a markup in the sense of, of not being part of the cost, but you should not think about it as a markup over the Fed funds rate. That would give you the wrong direction. It's, it's not, the Fed funds rate is not the cost of the deposit. You can create as many deposits as you want by paying the Fed funds rate and then charging that for loans that you make. The cost to you, the marginal cost is zero. So I don't want, people shouldn't get into the, I've heard that many, many times, but it's very confusing. It's, it's the, in the cost to, um, the cost to depositors is the spread. It is not the rate. It's just a, it's a wrong way to think about it. They give up whatever the spread is. If there's no spread, they don't give up anything. So don't, don't think of it as a markup over that. That's, it's, that's really, uh, it's really off. It doesn't work that way. But many people have said that to me. I've gotten that question and comment at the NBR so many times. So you're in good company. Um, okay, so the banks, they want non-runnable funding. Remember, we still have this, like the main risk is this run risk. Okay, the main catastrophic risk in order to invest in risky assets. What they don't wanna do is use runnable funding that is non-government quality funding, non-public funding, but then, then suffer a run because then they'll lose their funding and they have to sell the risky assets. Well, who do you sell the risky assets to? Well the funding for the risk takers is all shrinking. So you can't sell it to them. You have to sell it to the risk averse guys, but they naturally don't want them except at a very steep discount. So runs naturally lead to a price of risk uh, that explodes. And so there's naturally a fire sale on risky assets when there's a run. Now, knowing this, you don't want to, to get runnable funding if you can help it. But of course, that just means it's gonna be more expensive. And what I think of the shadow banks, people talk a lot about shadow banks, Shadow, a very good working definition are shadow banks are investment funds, investment companies that fund mostly by private funding, i.e. runnable funding. That's a very good working definition of them. Not deposits, that's why they're not banks, by stuff that's runnable and indeed ended up getting run on. That was the problem. So what we call wholesale funding from other institutions. Um, okay, overall, the amount of public 
or public private liquidity is scarce, meaning there's not an infinite amount of it. It has a positive price. So banks do end up needed to also on the margin when they run out of public funding, use some private funding. You can still use some. That's their wholesale funding. And we could see how much that is. It's a minority of the balance sheet, but it still adds up right now. They have 1.7 trillion of large time deposits and some other sources of wholesale funding, not so many. So that stuff is exposed to runs. That's the stuff that got run on in the global financial crisis, repo, commercial paper, uh, these kinds of things, wholesale funding. Okay, so, so that's the framework. Now, given that they have to, they can't do everything with public, funding because it's scarce, it's costly. They use some private funding. What do they do given that they know they might get run on? They hold, they want to hold some buffers of, of stuff that they could sell at minimal cost if they get run on. Okay. When they get run on, they won't have to sell everything. They'll just to sell a little bit of stuff and they keep some, some buffer for that. Okay. So what is that? That's, you don't want to hold risky assets as, as, as that because their price is going to fall very fast because everybody's shrinking the, the, all the financial intermediaries are shrinking the balance sheet. What you can sell is you can sell the stuff that the risk averse guys will buy, which is by construction, not private liabilities. That's exactly what created the run. They don't want them. You have to have stuff that's outside liquidity, stuff that's claims on the public, on the, on the government. And so what you want to hold is a buffer of public liquidity which as you can see then generates more demand for public liquidity. Okay, in the first place. Now, actually in the last couple of years since the global financial crisis, this has become codified in the regulation. So Basel III's liquidity coverage ratio says that you have to hold high quality liquid assets. They have all these acronyms, HQLA, in proportion to how much funding withdrawals you expect to see in 30 days. And there's all kinds of formulas. Uh, we were not thinking about that when we thought about all these things, but it does, you know, everybody got, I guess, the same uh, uh, experience from this. And so they wanted people to hold that. And I think some of that stuff was, 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 was uh, liquidated in March when we had the crisis and treasuries did all this crazy stuff. Um, okay. So, uh, and banks themselves tend to mostly hold government MBS, not so much treasuries, but, but very similar again. Okay. So uh, government uh, guaranteed stuff. Okay, so now if you're holding a buffer of public liquidity, what's the cost to you on the margin? It's the liquidity premium. So if that thing is high, okay, besides having less public deposit, public uh, funding, like deposits, your buffer is also more expensive. And so when you're thinking about how much risk to take, you have to take into account the cost of this buffer. Okay, it's kind of bothering you on the margin. A higher cost of the buffer means that when you take risk and you have to add some buffer, you pay a, big, a bigger penalty. And so that on the margin reduces your willingness, your, your, your demand to take risk. And since the financial sector is the main risk, represents the main risk tolerant people, okay, that decreases the overall risk taking. So a higher nominal rate decreases the amount of non-runnable funding by the deposits channel. It increases the cost of using runnable funding, the private stuff, okay, by, by making the liquidity premium higher. Okay, and so that on the margin affects the desire to, to take risk. So that's the sense in which you think increasing interest rates does to risk premium what the NK model says it does to the real rate, which is raise it and, uh, and then hold back the amount of risk taking and uh, uh, the amount of investment, you know, the, and then the price of uh, risky assets. Of course, remember it's endogenous. So probably if you raise rates, it's because things are going well. So the two forces counteract each other. So it's not like you could just run a regression and see a negative correlation, but it is consistent with Bernanke Kuttner, which shows that if you can identify a, a monetary policy uh, uh, hike, you do see a negative shock to the prices of, to the risk premium. It's consistent with Hansen Stein because again, that was about the risk premium in long-term real forwards. And it's consistent with the idea of the Greenspan put, which is uh, that the Fed lowers rates to prop up the stock market. And in our JF paper, we construct a dynamic model, which I'm not gonna go into here, that as an really is about this, this buffer um, mechanism. It's a very simple mechanism. We just wanted to put it in a standard model with risk averse and risk uh, more, less risk averse and more risk averse people and um, agents, if you will, and, uh, and have this buffer constraint, you know, liquidity buffer holdings, and then see how different nominal rate rules 
affect things and you can create something like a Greenspan put, which is when, when things go bad, you start to decrease the rates and then you can see that the price gets propped up from there. Okay, um, there's a question. Um, okay, uh, maybe I should have asked it earlier, but if liquidity premium increases with Fed funds rate, why don't banks increase deposit rates to raise more liquidity from the household sector? Well, remember that the liquidity premium increases because they don't raise deposit rates that much. Right, they're trying to squeeze the depositors. They don't want to pay them a lot of a high rate. So they don't raise the rate that much. They don't create that much deposits. People are going to other public liquidity things like bond funds that hold treasuries. There isn't that much more public liquidity. In fact, there's, like I said, less. That's why the liquidity premium goes up. Okay, so uh, they don't want to increase deposit rates. In fact, because they don't increase them that much, I mean, they, they increase them 40% of the increase in the Fed funds rate on average. So it's not zero at all. It's far from being 100. And that's why that happens. And then another question, do you have any thoughts of how to incorporate model monetary policy effectiveness under different degrees of uncertainty, like 19 uncertainty? Most focuses on risk and not uncertainty. Um, I wrote my job market paper on robust control in 19 uncertainty. Um, I don't let me not say much about that right now. I, I don't think that that's a useful, I don't really think that that's a useful uh, avenue to take on this, I'll be blunt. Um, I don't think you're gonna get differences that are that exciting. Uh, there are papers on 19 uncertainty in monetary policy. I, I think it's not worth the, the hardship of the modeling, put it that way, but I'm happy to offline discuss it. Um, Okay, Justin, can this mechanism occur fast enough to impact stock prices? I mean, we see that stock prices move in reaction to interest rate changes. It's not that the deposit flows happen instantaneously, they don't, although you saw that the deposit spreads do basically within a week. But of course, everybody knows, I mean, from experience, they don't have to understand the channel. From experience, you know that the liquidity premium will go up, you know that there will be less funding available. Just like I said, there's this refrain from practitioners that the Fed is draining liquidity from the system. Though, like I said, I never knew what that meant really. So prices are forward looking. So just because it hasn't happened yet and it will take a quarter to happen or two quarters, doesn't mean that, the, that you can't now understand or from experience see that, that the risk tolerance, or the average risk aversion or risk tolerance has gone up. Right, so that would, it's kind of an effect on average risk aversion. Doesn't mean it has to happen, it only happens slowly. That would be like an arbitrage. If you, if you could see it coming down the pike and not, prices haven't moved yet, it would be an arbitrage. Um, how does banks lending to household or firms operate in the process of banks seeking for liquidity buffer? Is it just the default risk of during crisis and banks will try to reduce risk more? Um, so I think on the margin, what I'm saying is by having to hold a liquidity buffer, there's a penalty or tax you can think of that goes up and so you may have lots of great opportunities to lend in the sense people want the loans and they can pay a higher rate, but then the penalty also goes up. So it holds you back somewhat. So people say that monetary policy leans into the wind. I guess it's better than pissing into the wind. Um, and uh, it, that's, the, that's the idea that it sort of counteracts growth. And uh, that happens in the NK model by increasing the real rate, happens in, in, in our framework here by by increasing the, the price of risk or the risk premium, which is also part of the cost of capital. And I, I think both can happen, they reinforce. Um, okay, I wanna also interpret central banks crisis policies. I mentioned that at the beginning. So conventional monetary policy, how do we interpret it in this light? Well, you notice at the beginning of crises, the, it happened again in COVID, the Fed cuts rates quickly. What's the point? Well, UNK model tells you you wanna stimulate the economy. Here, they cut the interest rate to lower the liquidity premium and increase private risk taking. You, give, you make liquidity as cheap as possible and you allow for as much private risk taking as possible to counteract the, the crisis, which is the crisis itself, as it, based on the way we're viewing it, is a contraction in the, in the private sector's ability to take risk. You're doing what you can to counteract that. It doesn't tend to be enough precisely because if the run is strong enough, the fact that you can hold buffers more easily is not that helpful. Um, they run on all your wholesale funding, all your private liabilities, it's still quite a lot. So that brings us to unconventional policy. And I think unconventional policy is not fit so easily in the NK toolbox. Uh, one of it is forward guidance. I'm not gonna talk about that. I don't think there's that much evidence that's worked. But more uh, obvious unconventional policy is like expand, start throwing around government guarantees, guarantee money market mutual funds, 
that happened in 2008. Set up uh, a fund that the Fed runs that's a bad asset fund where you can dump all kinds of like risky or liquid stuff in there so that the banks don't hold it. In, in Europe, the ECB did very strong lender of last resort. The Fed did this also. Uh, Philip and I wrote a paper about this, uh, evaluating it. Um, lender of last resort is when the Fed or the central bank, the European Central Bank, lends more against assets than the private market is willing to do. Okay, this goes way back to the beginning of central banking. That's like the central bank seeing that there's a contraction in the amount people are willing to lend to the financial sector and saying, okay, never mind, I'll do it. And you could come to me and get your, your funding to keep risk taking up. That's the way we interpret it. Uh, and then also uh, buying risky assets directly. We saw that the Fed this time set up the secondary market corporate credit facility to buy bonds and ETFs directly. That was the first time that's ever happened. They literally own those things. Uh, if you want to see a nice paper, uh, Dejanir Silva uh, constructed a dynamic model in this vein of unconventional policy, which I think is at the RFS. Okay, so um, uh, any questions before I move on? Uh, there's a question, how does it influence long run term premium? I think that's an excellent question. That's an open question, I think. Somebody's scribbling on my screen. Uh, I think um, you can think about the ways that, that it would do that. So, I, so the, the, the Hansen Stein, and I had a slide on this, if you go to our JF paper, you can see it, by increasing the risk premium, the price of risk, you are increasing the risk premium associated with forward rates and therefore causing the term premium to go up, which is what Hansen Stein observed in 10 year forward rates. Okay, so we, we actually have that. It's the last figure in the paper where we, we uh, do an impulse response and look at long term forwards and it, it exactly uh, captures that aspect of it. So that's what they were arguing anyway, that it's a risk premium and here it happens. It also gives you an upward sloping yield curve because high nominal rates are times where holding everything else equal, there's less risk taking, less risk sharing. So those are uh, times where there's higher risk premium, holding everything else equal. There's another question and then I also wanted to follow up on something that I'm confused yeah. about, but you may want we know to that banks face capital requirements. And if I think of this as a constraint on the deposits relative to assets, what happens if this constraint binds? Okay, so um, banks do face capital requirements, uh, which are now more complicated because deposits are considered better source of funding now than other sources. So you have less constraints on them. I don't think, you know, there's always this tension in banking that if you think that there's a constraint and the banks are up against the constraint, then there's nothing to do. They're always at the constraint and the constraint should tell you everything. And so banks never, you know, reduce or increase assets any more than equity, but they also never really change equity much. So nothing should change. Clearly that doesn't happen. So why is that? It's an excellent question. I think they're not really constrained. So there, there's ways around the constraint or there's ways, areas in which the constraint binds more or less. You can also, you know, you can switch from holding something risky and a liquid to something safer and more liquid. That can have an effect, a big effect on the price of risk, but it, it will not be seen by the capital requirements. I mean, there are different risk weightings and stuff, but they're hardly perfect. I mean, the sovereign debt crisis showed us that based on the rules, the banking rules, all the sovereign debt of the European countries faced no risk weight as long as they were held by European banks, even though some of them looked like junk bonds. And so they had this concern that banks would go buy them to, to circumvent capital requirements. But capital requirements uh, are, do not strictly bind. We can see that now, banks are pretty well capitalized. So I think that's, that's always a question though. It's a good question. I always wondered it myself. You can see a lot of stuff going on that would not happen if they were just up against this constraint. It would make banking the most boring thing ever. And, and that's clearly, you know, there's lots of ways they can get around these things with some cost. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. So uh, there's this paper right by by Skander, Skander van der Heuvel and you guys at Kreischik about uh, interest rate risk and, and bank mm -hmm. stock returns. And basically it says that, well, if it's a bank is very dependent on deposits and the very short term deposits, then they have a big, big stock return reaction to uh, to 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 rate cuts or, or rate raises. But there is also this sort of slope, slope of the term structure. Yeah effect that uh, I, I can put that link in the, I don't know if you want to talk about Oh, I know, it. I know the paper, yeah. But uh, I'll put the link in here. But sure. um, the question that I have is that what I'm confused about in, in all of this is that 
you said in the previous well in the previous slide that the, the raising of the rates raises the risk premium but i thought the, the whole point of the green squid put is that the cutting of the rates increases the rate the risk premium in a sense that it makes you know makes risky assets more attractive so that people buy them and and, and pushing up the price and we generally think in most of our models uh you know reduced form models of time varying risk premium we have short rates co-moving negatively with with risk premia and i thought that the mechanism would be well fed cuts rates and that because of it increases the risk premium it encourages people to take take risk at least that's how i think no no yeah I, I don't i don't think so so i i think the idea is well if it increased the risk premium it would make the prices of that stuff go down unless the risk-free rate cut overwhelmed the risk premium effect. That's, that's, that would go against the Bernanke cut in the result. I think, I think it's simpler. I think it makes, it's good news for prices. It makes, in, under our interpretation, it makes liquidity cheaper. It makes risk taking easier. And so all else equal, it, run, it decreases the penalty for taking risk. It makes it easier and cheaper. And so you just, the risk takers, you know, it increases their power and they run off to buy more risky assets, driving the risk premium down and the price up. Okay. That's so that's but, okay, that's con okay. It's just okay. I think it that's also goes with the concern people have that by raising risk taking or leverage or any of these things that you eventually that you can't keep doing it and you'll run into a problem. Now you can see in the paper to what extent that does or doesn't happen. But that's always the concern that it's kind of quote unquote artificial. By the way, for everybody out there, I think this Fed put has become more important than ever. Nobody's still like, practitioners are all sure it's there. I don't know what academia thinks. People are okay with it, but there's not been that much on it. And um, there just hasn't been that much. I think it's like more important than ever. You see it all the time. I mean, the Fed steps in so much. It's part of what I'm saying. There's a lot of government intervention. The government intervention, the, the public liquidity, it's it's not like it's a small thing. It's a huge thing. I think it's more important than we've let on, uh, or at least it, than you might learn in grad school. Maybe, maybe depends which school you go to. But I think it's uh, I think it's pretty huge. Um, regarding Skander's paper, I don't want to start something here, but uh, the next thing I was going to show, and I don't know if I'm running out of time, which is a paper we just have forthcoming in JF, is and basically saying they're wrong. I mean, it's not about their paper, but they ran a regression and they'd look at two things. They look at the slope of the yield curve and the short rate. And they have those things both in the regression and they read off a coefficient while holding the other one constant, but you, they never are constant. They're super duper correlated because one is like the 10 year rate and the other one. So they break the 10 year rate and up into like the two year rate and the 10 minus two. And since those things move together, interpreting what happens to one holding the other one constant might be interesting, but it's something that never actually occurs in reality. So, so you get these coefficients, but if you actually look at what happens to stock returns of banks, they don't move much with the interest rate, which is kind of the point of the, the paper we have forthcoming in the JF. So I think there's a lot of reasons that what they did there is interesting. They actually looked at something that people should have looked at, but I, I don't really think they found much. Um, so, I'll do this part very fast because I want to get to the last papers. And I think it's the one that opens up the most new questions, um, which is, so this goes to what next question is, it's an application of, of this stuff. So one question that occurred to us is why, why do banks do maturity transformation, which is one of their main things and how do they do it? What do I mean by that? So what's maturity transformation is banks borrow short term, that's deposits. They lend long term, right? They make long term loans, they buy securities. And that creates a pretty big maturity or duration mismatch, which I'm sure many people have heard about. But that means that when the interest rate goes up, or let's say the floating, you know, floating rate, like on a deposit, goes up, you have to pay more interest to your on your liabilities because they're basically all short term. But you're receiving the long term fixed coupon of your assets, and that's not changing. So your cash flows are going to go down. Now, in present value, you can present value that. That means that you pay more, receive less. So you should see an immediately immediate fall in your in your net present value. Okay, so that's maturity or duration mismatch says when interest rates go up surprisingly, you should take a hit. Now, according to the textbook view of banks, they they do this, but they do it because it's a term premium. So they get the nice term premium and they're taking risk, they're risk takers. And they have exposure to interest rates. So that sounds good. I believed in that mostly. But um, 
And so it says, if you see a rise in the short rate, your expenses go up, your profits should fall. So in the cash flows, your profits should fall because you take in the same amount of interest coupons, but you pay out more. And if you look at the stock price, the stock price should go down. Now you can't look at all the assets and liabilities because those, those are complicated and not marked to market. But if you look at their cash flow, so we don't know their price exactly, but we can see their cash flows and we can see the equity of the bank. So capital should be depleted. And um, it, when, when interest rates go up and that does a, should be a big risk to banks. Okay. Now, some people have in fact taken this and thought about it as an important channel for how the Fed can affect banks. They call this the bank balance sheet channel, the idea that the Fed impacts banks through their interest rate exposure. Okay. There's a, and indeed banks do have a big duration mismatch. So we proxied for a duration from the call reports with, with the next time they reprice, we call it repricing maturity. It's not quite the same thing as duration, it's pretty close. And there's a pretty consistent four year difference between their average asset repricing maturity, which is four years. So then they have some eight years, they have some short stuff, they have some 20 year stuff, but on average it's about four. And their liabilities, which are about six months, and uh, so it's, sorry, it's about four and a half and 0.5. So the difference is about four years. And think about what that means. It means if you have a cumulative set of surprises, they don't have to happen at one time, but if, if there's a bunch of little shocks that add up all together to a hundred basis point surprise increase in the level of rates, that accumulated surprise will lead to, uh, it's, it's like having four years of 100 basis points lower net income because your expenses go up 100 basis points, your assets don't change. And in, four per, and in PV terms, that's like losing 100 basis points four years in a row. So it's basically like a 4% drop in assets. Okay, if you think a duration is four, if interest rates go up by a percent, you lose 4%. And you might think, what's the big deal? 4% drop in assets, but banks are levered 10 to one. So that would be a 40% drop in equity. Now, 100 basis points accumulated shocks is nothing. It's not gonna happen in one day, but over six months a year, it's nothing. If you look at the volatility of interest rates, it prices that in easily. So that should mean, and we've seen lots of those happen where suddenly rates start to go up. So that means we should see lots of times when equity of banks drops by 40% to 100% and should cause massive crises, and yet we don't. In fact, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, we had uh, treasury rates fluctuate almost 100 basis points in a couple of days, okay? So, um, Okay, so it's not big by historical standards. And yet if we run a regression of the bank sector on changes in one year rates to capture kind of forward looking interest rate policy on in high frequency on FOMC days, and we look at all industries, the Fama French 49, banks are kind of middle of the road. They drop, their equity drops about 4% per 100 basis point shock, not 40. And it's the same as in the market in general. So it looks like a standard discount rate effect. It does not look like they massively have a duration mismatch. And it's a question of how, how is this possible? I mean, they clearly have a lot of duration, but why do they just look like your average non-financial firm? So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this because I wanna to get to the last paper, but I'll give you, uh, I'll just do a couple slides and I'll skip, give you the, the, the the answer to the puzzle. Um, so here's the Fed funds rate again over the last 60 years. It's had huge surprises. Nobody knew in 1960 that by 1982, the Fed funds rate would go up to close to 20 per 18%. That was all basically a shock. Okay, there's about 12, 15% of shock in there. So they should have, banks should have gotten destroyed over that time period if, if they were to be, if they would have this kind of duration mismatch. And now let's look at banks interest income rate. So that's their interest income divided by assets. This is like their average coupon that they get or interest rate on their assets. Uh, and we took this from the call reports. It looks kind of like you think, like a long-term bond. Doesn't vary as much as the Fed funds rate, but tracks it pretty well. Basically very similar to a four or five year bond. Okay, much smoother. But here's their interest expense rate. This is the average interest that they pay all together divided by their, uh, their, their liabilities. And that thing doesn't look at all like the Fed funds rate. So now you know why too, because of market power. So when you look at this, the mistake in the textbook model is that it should look like the Fed funds rate if they pay the competitive rate, in which case you really would have a problem. If you go back here, every time that the Fed funds rate shot up, surprisingly, and it was not priced into long-term bonds, they would have gotten destroyed. They would have, taken a huge increase in their expenses with no corresponding increase in the assets and they're gotten destroyed like here, here, here. And on the other side, as rates have gone down, they would have had a huge windfall 
because we've seen rates surprise on the way down all the time. But in fact, so we haven't seen all these crises happen. And, and the reason is their interest expense rate is much lower and smoother than the Fed funds rate. And in fact, seems to match the sensitivity of their income really well. So the gap between them, which is the, what's called their net interest margin, which is where their profits come from, is super smooth. Okay, so let me show it to you. It's right there. So there's been almost no variation over uh, 65 years in this net interest margin, really little. I've had people in seminars argue with me that it's still changing. So yes, it's not 100% constant, but it's just very tiny. It's got no correlation with uh, the Fed funds rate and it's a very tiny standard deviation. And if you wanna compare it, eventually we realize we have to show people what it would look like if, it real, if banks really worked like a long short portfolio. If you paid the Fed funds rate and owned five, four or five year treasuries, okay, then this is what your net interest margin would look like. Because your income would exactly track the bank. We, we've shown that in the paper. And your expense would track the Fed funds rate and your net interest margin would look like this, which would show that from 1965 to 1980 something, you would lose basically almost every year. And you would, get, you would, you would go bankrupt many times over. Because remember, this is multiplied by 10 for leverage. And then from then on, you'd be, for many years, you'd make huge windfalls. But instead, the red line shows you that almost nothing has happened. So you can see how much different the, the, the fluctuations are in the, in the total cash flows. And the reason is what we saw already is that banks have a lot of market power over the rates they pay. So the deposit rate only increases by 40 basis points per 100 basis point. So in that sense, their expenses are a little bit like short term, like 40% of their expenses move like the Fed funds rate and 60% doesn't change much. It's like a super long rate, it's fixed, okay? And, and this is most of their liabilities, okay? So over 70%. So in a way, some of their funding, even though it's nominally short term, right? Anybody can go get their deposits out anytime they want. They're not really uh, long term. In actual practice, function like long term. The bank has to worry about people pulling their money, but in actual practice, they mostly don't, and even though you don't raise rates that much. And so it's as if you had 40% short term funding and 60% long term funding. And that's the key. It lets you invest in long term stuff. Um, is there any graph of single branch? Name. I mean, one can make that. You can't go back to what it, you know the time period is in, but you don't have to go to single branches. You might guess what we did in this paper. Banks are not the same. Remember that there's a whole heterogeneity cross section of bank betas. Some are really very, very bank-like. Some are quite like money market funds. So we looked at their assets in the cross section. So I'm gonna skip the model, which is really, really simple. The model just says it's the world's simplest model. Uh, it says that banks should match the sensitivity of their expenses and their income to the in interest rate. So we do expense betas and in income betas. How much do you move your income and how much does, how much does your income move to the Fed funds or how much your expense? And our, the model says that they should match. So if you don't increase your expenses much, you have a lot of market power, you can hold stuff whose income doesn't very much. That's whose in cash flows don't very much. That's like a long-term bond. And if you have to increase your uh, payouts, it's very sensitively, like a, like a money market fund, you have to hold stuff whose income is very sensitive, like, like a money market fund. Okay, so uh, we basically uh, estimate the interest expense beta and the interest income beta, same thing as before, run regressions on lagged Fed funds. And here's the picture. I think it's a pretty good fit. So this is his uh, bin scatter plot of interest expense betas against interest income betas. So this is, now, how much you move your expenses with the Fed funds rate, some are 0.6. So the expense moves quite a bit with the Fed funds rate. They pay 60 basis points for every 100. Some are very, very little. They pay, let's say 20 basis points for every 100. And their income betas line up almost exactly on a 45 degree line. So each of these is a bin. So it looks better than if it was individual banks, but there's a lot of banks in each bin. And so you see that there's this matching. And um, these are just the top 5% of banks. There's fewer banks, it's noisier, but still a very good fit. Uh, and you can see that banks that have higher expense betas, they look more like competitive. They have to hold lower duration assets. That's what this shows. This is the duration of the assets. 
Okay, and it's a very big coefficient. It's almost minus four, minus 366. So it's very similar to the explaining the total difference in their duration. Here's the, um, regarding Nick's question from before. So if you look at the assets of banks and look at their duration, proxied by this repricing maturity, this is kind of the way I would have started the Skander and the Krychek paper too. It's like, let's look at banks average duration of their assets. Some have like an average duration close to seven, some it's two. Definitely the ones with the duration of seven, they seem to hold a, do a lot of maturity mismatch. Probably their stock prices should be very uh, sensitive to, to monetary policy shocks. That's FOMC betas, but they're not. They're almost the same as the ones that have low asset duration. Now, what they did is they ran a bivariate regression with the control that I said is very correlated with the other variables. So you can't interpret it by itself. But basically, these are tiny, tiny differences. There's almost nothing here. And you might think, how is it possible that even asset duration cannot predict the stock price change? I mean, how dumb are the people in the stock market? Or how confused are we about duration? But you got to remember, it's all about identification. There's, there's endogenous choice of asset duration. They did not choose these things by accident. In fact, if you look at either the interest income beta or the expense beta, there's a lot of variation in both, but neither of them predicts the change in the stock price. And why is that? It's because the guys who have the high income beta choose a high expense beta for their liabilities and low income beta, low expense beta. So when you take the difference between them, it's basically zero and they have no exposure to interest rates. Uh, in terms of their cash flows. And so then there shouldn't be any response in the stock price, at least no response due to the cash flows, maybe just pure discount rate effects. And so, okay, so that's, that's what I have here. So if we have one where we just take the, the, so you can see these, either beta against the FOMC beta, no relationship, and it's because they match. And that was, the matching was this. Okay, so, all right. All right, so the last thing I wanna do in the, in the time that remains, um, wait, so there's a question Nina asked me a question. Are you kind of leaning towards low feds power and affecting bank activity and in turn economic activity? So I don't think this doesn't mean that the fed doesn't have power. It's a really good question. The fed doesn't affect their equity capital by shocking their duration mismatch. It's been used in a bunch of papers. I'm sorry to say, I think it's just a mistake. Cause you can see they just don't, there's not there. Doesn't mean they don't have power. Remember the deposits channel stuff. Deposits, the power works not through their equity. This is also what I meant originally that I said that just sticking in bank equity into an NK model is, it's good, but it's, it's not that good. Um, the, the power works through the production of liabilities, the amount of public liquidity, among other things, but this is really where we see the margin of adjustment. So there's no effect on their, the net present value of their holdings but they do reduce the amount of deposits they produce and therefore public liquidity a lot. That's why we saw the liquidity premium moving. It's just not because they shock their equity. So, and that makes sense. They know that they have this market power. They wanna be hedged to interest rates. So they pick their assets such that on the asset side, it matches the sensitivity of their funding. And it works for mutual, money market mutual funds. Money market mutual funds hold all short-term paper. It's because their funding is completely competitive. Okay, and, um, and for banks, you see a whole, a whole heterogeneity there. Some are like that, some are very different than that. They match, they do this on purpose. If you look through consulting, there are a lot of consulting firms that help banks to do this and measure how sensitive their deposits are. So once we started looking into it, there's a whole industry for this. Those people would probably be very surprised to learn that other people don't know this because that's their job. So banks are very, very aware of this. That's kind of their business to a large extent. Uh, the deposit base, the, the commercial banks. Um, and yet they care about interest rates a lot because they have to think about how much outflows they're gonna have, how much buffer they need to hold and all of these other things. It's just not happening through this duration mismatch. Um, and you can think about the implications of that. It seems like it shuts down a channel, but it actually just gives you greater clarity in, into kind of what they have to do. As, they, as deposits flow out and they have to hold more buffer they potentially have to hold less illiquid risky assets. You can think about what that does to their holdings of long-term bonds and various other things. And some of these things we haven't, I, I know what I think the answers are, but we haven't worked through them. Um, okay. Uh, so it seems the bank's both lending rate and borrowing rate is sluggish. So the lending is not sluggish. That was the coupon 
on, think of it as the average coupon on their assets. So if I buy a five-year treasury, its coupon is gonna be the same for the next five years. So what you saw on the income side is not sluggish, it's simply that they hold long-term fixed rate stuff on average. Whereas the fact that it was sluggish on the liability side is surprising because that stuff is all overnight. Deposits you can pull out at any point and the rate is completely floating. So the asset side was totally expected. It, it almost matches exactly if you look at the paper with holding a portfolio of four-year treasuries. If you look at a portfolio of four-year to five-year treasuries, the cash flows on that almost exactly match banks. That's like the, the, the asset side. That's not the interesting side. The interesting side is on the liability side. And that doesn't look at all like the Fed funds rate. Okay, so I'm gonna get to this last part. I might run five minutes over, but hopefully not much. Um, so the last thing which is our new stuff is, and I, and I hope this brings the most number of questions, is um, we're gonna reappraise in light of some of these th results, some of the uh, narrative of, of uh, macroeconomic history, at least since we have the banking data. Um, so macro, like any field, has developed basic storylines that frame economist understanding of macroeconomic history. And the question I have is, and I have this for everybody, and I think if you're a student or starting, you know, if you're junior faculty, I think it's useful to go back and read some of this stuff and see if you can think again, reconsider some of this narrative based on some of the things we've talked about and other things people have done about the connections between monetary policy, liquidity, and risk premium. Um, there are definitely parts in there that are puzzling and don't fit neatly, right? Macro and economics in general, unfortunately, we have more, more holes than cheese. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work. And uh, so looking into some of these puzzles can be real sources of new insights. They have for me, you suddenly notice something and you're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. And I under think I understand why it's happening. And you'll start to look into it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But when it does, it's very, uh, it's, it's very interesting. And when you open up part of the narrative, if it changes, it can cause you to reappraise the parts that come after it, which is where I'm getting at here. So what I'm gonna do at the remaining time is look at our new work, which looks at a new look at the great inflation. This is the period from 1965 to 1982. It was arguably the most influential period in uh, the development of monetary policy and, and maybe macro as well, because it changed, maybe as students, many people heard about it, rational expectations and, and, and putting expectations into, into um, models and then thinking of, uh, of uh, credibility for the Fed. All these things came, at least the way the story goes, out of the policy problem of the great inflation. So the great inflation was the, that period where prior to it, inflation was low, the economy was doing very well and uh, there was high growth with low inflation and, and, and I think central banks felt they knew what they were doing. And during this time period, things got kind of progressively worse. Inflation went further and further up. It was also volatile. So it went up and down, up and down, but every time a little bit higher. The Fed raised rates a lot. Rates got the crazy highs, like you saw close to 20%, but inflation just kept going higher. And this presented a real problem because a crisis for Keynesians, and that was the dominant paradigm, because their basic toolkit stopped working. The basic trade-off was the idea of the Phillips curve. You can trade off and you can have uh, uh, change the amount of inflation, uh, increase inflation to get um, lower unemployment, you can kind of run the economy hot. But in fact, during this time period, we have what's called the stagflation. At high inflation, and at the same time, terrible economic growth and high unemployment. So that, that really sucks. Uh, and uh, uh, that was the problem. And I don't really think it's been, part of it has not been resolved, but the narrative that has emerged blames the Fed. And a very, very famous set of papers, Clarita Galli Gertler, there's thousands and thousands of, of, of sites, argued, and not everybody in macro agrees on this, but I think it's, it's, it's the most well-known paper, that the Fed didn't raise rates aggressively enough in, re, in response to inflation, that higher inflation expectations set in. So later, ta you know, Taylor came and introduced the idea of Taylor rule. And in terms of the Taylor rule, and they came after that, uh, they interpret it as a coefficient less than one. So the Fed didn't raise the nominal rate more than one for one with inflation. They didn't lean into the wind. And as a result, the economy tended to overheat and you could get basically where people expect there to be high inflation, it's self-fulfilling. That's the explanation that, that's kind of the bulk of the explanation. The Fed lost credibility. And so they interpret that there are these sunspots. People just thought there might be higher inflation and I don't know how that happens, but uh, that leads to inflation. 
I've heard that it, it sounds a little comp, a little fanciful to me, but some version of the Fed losing credibility is the story. And then Paul Volcker is very famous Fed chairman um, is given the credit for restoring the Fed's credibility is a very famous narrative. He comes in at first, he doesn't have much success, but about two, three years in, he decides he's going to raise rates and keep them there even as the economy enters into a very severe recession and the double dip 1981, 1982 recession. Afterwards, inflation, as the narrative goes, stayed low. Interest rates stayed pretty high for a while until they felt late, much later on that, that inflation was under control. And then economists afterwards, there's a long period with low inflation, which we still have in moderate business cycles, much more moderate than before, which we called the great moderation that ended in 2008. There's a lot of papers on that. But this credibility view of the Fed created by Volcker underlies basically, I think, the idea of forward-looking expectations and monetary policy theory and practice until today. Okay, so we're gonna reassess this. So the great inflation in a plot, we have the Fed funds rate, which you've now seen 20 times, and the forward-looking one-year inflation rate. So these are timed to be the same, one-year forward-looking at each point, Fed funds rate, one-year forward-looking inflation. And the beginning of the great uh, inflation is dated to be the beginning of 1965. Here is 1980, quarter four. This is Volcker's famous super rate hike. As you can see, raised rates tremendously and kept them there even as the, as the inflation went down. So real interest rates at that point and later became very, very high. Before that, you can see real interest rates were quite low. And that's the complaint that, uh, that's the difference between the lines that the Fed didn't raise rates enough. And inflation rose from being under 2% in 1965, where it had been for a decade, to 14% in 1979. And after Volcker was back to 2% in 1982, though there was some other little episodes. Okay, so that's the narrative. Now, the stagflation looks like this. So the stagflation um, is, if we put GDP growth on there, you could see a very clear pattern. So during these times where there was inflation, rather than the economy overheating and you're getting low, unsustainably low unemployment, which is what this very famous Phillips curve says should happen. And you, you at least, you know, you get the bad inflation, but at least you get high growth. In fact, quite the opposite happened. It seemed to damage GDP and I could draw unemployment for you. It would look the same as GDP. Well, look the opposite of GDP, you'd get high unemployment. And the very first instance of this actually happens in 65, you can see, which is uh, growth went from positive quite, it fell quite sharply. Uh, and then every single time after that, when inflation goes down, GDP goes up. When inflation goes up a lot, and the Fed raises rates, GDP goes down. And that I think was really driving them nuts and is something that just fundamentally goes against the Phillips curve. Okay, so the way people explain this with the narrative is ex expectations became unanchored. But to my understanding, I don't think anybody's really explained the stag part of the inflation. They can explain why inflation went out of control, the Fed lost credibility, but not, it's still the case even in modern, um, in the modern uh, NK model that there's a Phillips curve built in. If you have high inflation, you should have uh, relatively good employment. And that's clearly not the case here. The other thing is the GDP was very volatile, much more volatile than it's been ever since. You had three recessions over about 15 years, which is a, a lot. Okay, so what we do in this paper is I want to say we reassess, and I think a lot of makes me reassess a lot of different things. I hope maybe some of you get some ideas from it. What caused this? And we propose a test, a new explanation, and we go back to a very famous law that historians know and banking people know. It's called Regulation Q. So I bet some people have heard of it. We're saying that the great the rise and fall of inflation was due first to the imposing and later the repeal of this famous law, Regulation Q. And many developed countries had similar laws. It's a kind of financial repression. It put hard ceilings on the rates that banks could pay on deposits. Okay, this went back to the Great Depression, but it never mattered. It never was binding until 1965. Okay, so you, there was some ceiling, but it was above anything people wanted to pay. It only bound in 1965, and the Fed chose not to change it. Um, and deposits were the main form of saving for most households, much more even than now. And so what Reg Q did is suppress the return to saving. Okay, inflation went up, but they couldn't get anything more on their saving because banks weren't allowed to pay them anything. There wasn't really much of anywhere to go. Just like they don't go too much now, there was even less then because markets were less um, developed and deposits were more important. So this completely disabled the transmission of interest rate changes to households. There was just no pass through at all. So 
I'll go a few more minutes and then I'll just wrap up here. Um, so here's the ceiling uh, on the most common kind of deposit. They were slightly different for different deposits, but they were pretty similar. Uh, and these were savings deposits. And you can see the ceiling actually goes back to like the 30s, but interest rates were low and it never mattered. And in fact, when interest rates went up, they would tend to raise the ceiling. You could see it a little bit here to avoid it binding. It was mostly meant to keep banks that were in trouble from, from, from abusing their guarantee, deposit guarantees and raising rates to some crazy level. So it didn't matter for most banks. It just didn't matter much. But then in 1965, actually because the economy was heating up a little bit, there was a buildup to Vietnam War and there was a lot of growth, the Fed thought it would be a good idea to try to tamp and down inflation by essentially doing this, by, by binding the ceiling and then making people, uh, making banks not get as much deposits as they were otherwise. And then they figured that that would slow down credit growth. They were very worried about credit growth. It was actually kind of a, a modern way to look at things. And they thought if we just stick uh, sand in the gears and uh, won't allow for credit growth, then that we won't get as much growth in inflation. We could slow down inflation. And they did throw sand in the gears, but it didn't do what they thought. That's we're arguing what they thought it would do. It did kind of the opposite. So. It becomes binding and essentially remains binding throughout because you can see that the Fed funds rate in blue is almost always above it. Okay, so what was happening to the real deposit rate? Well, that's the difference between the, the, the ceiling and the inflation rate, which is in red. And you could see it's just the, the mirror image then around that ceiling. It goes down and down over this time period. Every time inflation goes up, the real deposit rate plummets more. And this is on a huge amount of wealth because deposits are very big. So it goes from plus 2% before the ceiling was binding. That was kind of the rate facing most people to minus 8% by 1979, which is just an atrocious return to make on your uh, most of your wealth. In contrast, the real Fed funds rate, which is what the literature has looked at, is the difference between the blue and the red line. And that's basically zero. So the literature says that was too low. But if you look at the, what most people were actually facing, it was much lower. In fact, if you multiply the real deposit rate by the amount of deposits relative to consumption, you see that people were losing about 4% of consumption in aggregate every year, which is worse than, that's every year for, de for their deposits, they were getting, losing 4% of consumption, which is a, it's a really big amount. Okay, so how does this create inflation? Well, um, it suppresses the return to saving. So that gets people to spend more. It's basically in that sense, like an NK model. That puts upwards pressure on goods prices and leads to higher inflation. But because the rate cannot adjust at all, higher inflation means that deposit rate becomes even worse, the real deposit rate, which leads to more demand, which leads to more inflation. And uh, Milton Friedman gave a very famous talk sort of before this all panned out, 1968, where not for this reason, but for other reasons, he was talking about monetary policy and he, he kind of theorized what would happen if there was a peg on the Fed funds rate. And he said inflation would run away. Now there was no peg on the Fed funds rate, but there was a peg on the rate that actually mattered to people at deposits. And so it's consistent with that. Now, how does it lead to the stag part of the stagflation? So that's connected, it's connected to what we've seen. It's a bit like deposits channel on, on, on uh, massive steroids. So you have a low deposit rate. Some people wanna get out of deposits. There's not that many places to go, but you become desperate. If you're losing 8% a year, you'll start to buy crap you don't even need just to store, uh, you know, you'll, you'll buy homes, you'll buy metals, you'll buy washing machines, anything durable. There's deposit outflows. Banks lost funding. In fact, that's part of the point from the point of view of the Fed. They call this disintermediation. And so they had to cut back lending. They, they caused credit rationing. And that led to some severe credit crunches firms couldn't get the lending that they needed, just like in the global financial crisis. And so that led to the unemployment in the GDP fall. So I'm gonna wrap up in a moment, but here's, if we wanna understand the stagflation, here's real bank, here's real deposit growth in black and real bank asset growth, which mirrors it closely. So as deposits went up and down, bank uh, total assets followed. So it's not like they were finding other funding. And you see that every time that there's inflation and Fed funds rate goes up and people go out of deposits somewhat, bank deposit growth goes down and assets fall. That's the credit crunches. Then when inflation goes down because the economy slows down, they come back into deposits and the opposite happens and so forth. And that's why GDP swings in the direction of the bank asset growth, not in the direction of the inflation.
So here's GDP growth. And you see that it it's not supposed to be right on top of it, but it's extremely highly correlated with throughout all of these cycles with the bank uh, asset growth, even including the very first point, 1965, when nobody sort of knew anything really bad was going on. And that is actually the first time they coined the term credit crunch. You can go back in the literature and see that this uh, imposition of the Q ceiling caused as if, uh, deposits to flow out in a credit crunch and um, caused the creation of that term, credit crunch. It goes back to 65, 66. Felix is asking, wouldn't firms get more income if people stop saving and start consuming so that they can rely on internal funds? So the issue is firms don't, on the, on the, on the, on the supply side, they don't have funds to actually um, produce. And so total output goes down. Everybody is getting uh, poorer. So, you know, what's going on is people want to consume more because they get terrible return on their savings. And normally that would exactly uh, pump up the economy. That's kind of in an NK model what happens. People consume more, but here firms can't produce more. It's not worth it for them. When they borrow, they can't get the funds or are being charged a very high amount for them. And so they lay off people. And so people want to consume more, but supply is down. So what you get is you get an outward shift in the demand curve and an inward shift in the supply curve and so what you get is you get lower output with higher prices. That's exactly uh, the stagflation. The, the, the firms are suffering. Things look terrible. They can't get loans. On the other hand, people don't want to save. They, don't, they want to give them the loans, but that's this huge wedge where the, the ceiling is causing a wedge between the borrowing and the lending rate. The lending rate was high. Uh, sorry, the borrowing rate was high. The lending rate was low. And that's, that's just a giant financial friction, which this uh, regulation Q created. And it, it, there were various versions of this law in many countries, in, in Britain, in France, not so much in Germany. And you see in Germany, there was a lot less inflation. So that, that's another thing, working on international is, is something kind of one of the things we, we've looked at. It, but there's a lot of financial repression. Are you sure if Alan Taylor was here, he could tell you about it. Um, I'll do one or two more slides and I'll call it a day, although uh, this is my, my favorite thing, but you'll have to look at it uh, if you're interested by yourself. What ended this? So Regulation Q was repealed in late 1978-79 with the introduction of new deregulated deposit accounts. So these were allowed to pay whatever they wanted. They're not all deposits, they were CDs, six month CDs, and their rates immediately shot up by 7% above the old ceiling. Just think about how much that is. And then it took a little while, but not that long. Household poured vast sums into the new accounts. 462 billion within a short period of time, which was 16% of GDP, it would be like three and a half trillion dollars in today's money. So they had to actively move the accounts and you see that they did. We use cross-sectional heterogeneity and how fast they move the accounts to look across different cities. That's what most of the paper is and see whether this pressure, this uh, releasing of the constraint affected inflation. So that places where the, households moved money faster, reduced inflation more than other places. And, and we, that's how we show that that was the case. Um, so here's the graph of it. You see what happens to the interest rates. They shoot up there. So these were money market certificates and small saver certificates. Those were the two kinds of, uh, of accounts that were created. Interest rates shoot up. They then track the Fed funds rate and inflation goes down. You can see it pretty much coincides. And so we think really that's what happened, not the Volcker thing. And you can see what happened to the real deposit rate then. It shoots up both because banks paid a lot more because they could and because inflation went down. This happened three quarters ahead of Volcker. So last graph here, it's definitely not the last one in the paper, but I have to stop. If we really zoom in and look at the timing of this, uh, Volcker happens in 1980 Q4. The new accounts are created here. It takes a little time for people to go into them, but not much. And you see that um, inflation in red actually starts to fall three quarters ahead of Volcker and uh, um, is, is uh, three quarters ahead of when Volcker hikes rates. So actually by the time Volcker hiked rates, it was down to less than 8%. It had been as high as 16%. And the other thing is, and even Volcker was aware of it, it that goes against the traditional expectation view that, that the credibility of the Fed reasserted people's correct expectations about inflation is that if you look at 10 year rates, they remained high for another four or five years. And then the explanation for that, I think, is people just didn't understand why inflation had gone down. It had happened before. As you can see, there was a lot of cycles. And they figured that once the Fed 
uh, took its foot off the brake and decreased rates, inflation would just come back like it had done three times before. And it was only in the later 80s that, uh, that, that rates started to come down. And I think that was a very long process that took about 20 years. But we think that the real reason for that is because this queue was, was not there anymore. Um, and so people could save, but I don't think the market understood that. So I'll skip everything else. There's a lot of cross-sectional work to prove that this is the point. And um, I'll leave you with the following questions for food, food for thought. Uh, this is what I'm asking myself. Uh, so do these findings change our understanding of the following things? There are other ones, but those are the ones that came to mind this morning when I made the slide. So the, there were high real rates in the 80s and they subsequently declined. Both nominal rates declined, but real rates. And I think that this new interpretation suggests a reason why the Fed kept real rates high in the 80s. And I think they did not understand why inflation had come down. But this had a lot of uh, implications for, the ter for our studies of the term structure, which you know interest rates are very persistent. So we, we, we depend a lot on, on analyzing this long decline that we've seen and on the return of long-term bonds. It suggests potentially different interpretations than, than in sample you know, fits would give you. Second thing is the importance of the financial sector for recessions. In this case, what we're showing in the cross-sectional work that I didn't get to present is that it mattered a lot. You know, we're trying to prove that this credit crunchers mattered a lot for these recessions, even though we don't think of these as financial crises. And so we know from 2008, the financial crisis, we kind of relearned that they're very important, but I think they were important the financial sector was actually important for what people think of as quote unquote garden variety recessions. I, I actually don't believe they exist. So I would think about the role of monetary policy in the great moderation. Why did the great moderation happen? I don't think it was because the Fed was, had learned such to be so vigilant. I think what had happened before was really an anomaly. And um, to think about the quiet period that Alan Taylor talked about, it was quiet in terms of crises, but at least the second half of it, I'm not sure it was that quiet. These things were not financial crises, but they sort of acted like financial crises. And then to think about something that came up a lot, which is the expansion of credit since the 80s. A lot of stuff starts in the early 80s, and it could be a coincidence. There are many long-term trends, but maybe some of them are related to this, uh, you know, the, the removal of these very harsh constraints in many countries. That, that coincided towards the end of the 70s. And the last thing I wanna say is the reason they removed regulation Q is not because they figured this out, is because the returns, on, the returns on deposits were so bad that the banks, which had previously liked them, started to beg Congress to basically get rid of this stuff so that they could compete with new instruments like money market mutual funds that were created for, to circumvent regulation Q. Okay, sorry for running so much over. Thank you. Thank you, Damar. Okay, uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks a lot for your, le for your great lecture and uh, thanks everyone for participating and uh, good questions. Um, and uh, this brings us to the last uh, day of our macro finance summer school tomorrow with Lars Lockstor and- We should, uh, should add that it's not at the usual time. It starts and, a bit later. Right, as I was going to say, we're, because Lars is on the, on the West Coast, plus we didn't want to, inter um, uh, interfere with the virtual finance workshop uh, that they host out there in UCLA. Um, we're starting uh, at 1.45 Eastern time, so hour and 45 minutes later than we have been doing. Uh, we send out an email with that reminder as well, but just to, just to make sure. And uh, it tomorrow, I think we'll play the MC tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So thanks again to everyone. And uh, We'll see you. We'll see you again tomorrow. And thanks. Uh, Thank you. Thanks everyone thanks for, for monitoring for uh, the chat. And thanks, Nina, to handling everything. Uh, you yeah, know, thank you, live Nina. And so on, and, and, and being the social media promoter of our society more generally. So thank you.